Well, I'm really happy to say that um, we, we made it to day two and yesterday I think was really wonderful and I'm grateful for all the speakers and, um, and the organizers and everything that made yesterday so wonderful and I'm looking forward to today and um, all of the great speakers that we have and, and our panel later that'll be um, I think quite wonderful as well and then finally our speech by our elder Cliff Poudry. Um, yeah, and for our first speaker, we have um, uh, Danae College undergrad, Alyssa Joe, who will be telling us about um, her work and her research. And so take it away. Thank you. Um, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, you can. Um, okay. So my presentation is master's at the Antion Pen, and um, it's a drug treatment that was uh, treated that they use um, 5X F80 mice with Alzheimer's. Um, a quick introduction, my name is Alyssa Joe. Uh, I'm from Johnny Nersha, so I'm going to be teaching this time to teach it in, um, in translation. I am single people born for the water flow together class. Uh, my maternal clan is the leaf people, and my paternal clan is the red runs into the water clan. I'm originally from Lucas, Arizona, and um, I'm also from the Kraken Nation of Utah. A quick note this is my conflict statement. Um, the study was um, supported by the state of Arizona by two pilot grants and the Arizona. Alzheimer's Consortium and the National Institute of Aging that was awarded to Dr. Um, Kathleen Roger, who is the PI of the project. Um, they also have a patent, invention patent for the RAS, RAS RX drug in 1902 and 1911, which is another important factor in this project. Um, quick background of Alzheimer's. Uh, when patients have Alzheimer's, they will have no symptoms. Um, it will slowly progress where they notice things, but it's commonly mistaken for normal aging until it starts interfering with their everyday activities. That's when they start noticing it. And then most times they get uh, diagnosed when it's moderate, when it becomes, when they start getting injured, doing things, forgetting things. And within that time period when they're diagnosed, they usually die within that first five years because they are unable to take care of themselves and remember to take medications and things they need to do. Um, a quick background within this study is oxidative stress. Um, it contributes to the Alzheimer's. And another factor was the cardiovascular disease has a high um, comorbidity with developing um, Alzheimer's. Um, in previous study, the Ringe angiotensin system um, had some potential therapeutic uh, opportunities. We are mainly going to be looking at A2 peptides. Another quick background about um, Alzheimer's is the protein is um, apoprotein E. Um, and their alleles of E2, E3, and E4. Um, within these alleles, um, when patients have them, they have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's, but they may have it and they might not even get Alzheimer's. It's a coin toss right there. Um, another thing to take into consideration was the plaque and tau's tangle. Um, this actually comes into how the angiotensin intensifies, um, and I will explain that in a couple slides. Um, so the way I understood the whole process of angiotensin system was um, in the brain, when you're injured, when you get injured, uh, this activates. 
this activates the parts in your brain and um, the liver starts to produce these chemicals that need to repair. Um, so in a normal person's body, it usually activates the AT2 receptors and the mass receptors and so on. But in a Alzheimer's patient's brain, it doesn't do that. It will activate the AT1 receptor and then it goes into a neuro, um, it causes inflation in the brain causing the body to intensify whatever is growing. So if a patient had uh, Alzheimer's and has Alzheimer's, it tells the body and the brain to start making more callus tangles, more plaque in the brain. So it intensifies as it goes. Um, what we're looking at is that mass receptor that's part of the A1 through seven. So the drug actually intensifies here, causing it to jump here and activating that mass receptor. So it becomes a protective uh, neural protection in the brain. So it tells the brain to stop. We should not be making all this stuff. And that's Leaving? the place of uh, the drug. I'm getting food together. I want to make sure that there's nothing that you want that I'm not putting in there. Maggie, you're unmuted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so that's the process of the drug and how it interacts with the engineered pension system. Um, I've explained this right here, but it's a little bit more clear. And the brain normally goes here for a person who is fine. Um, but when you have Alzheimer's, you don't activate certain parts of your brain properly. And the drug, the RAS1902 RAS, RX will activate the mass receptor in the brain. Um, it is noted that the mass receptor wasn't, they thought it did nothing at one point um, within recent studies. They found out it does promote healing in the brain. Um, so our testing model was the 5X FAD mice. Within these mice, it had the five gene that was associated with Alzheimer's, um, the Swiss, Florida, London mutations, as well as the FAD associated mice, which is listed below. Um, it, oh, it is um, it is noted the study was done on mice within a four month time period. Um, they were separated. I was able to work with the female mice in particular. There was a set of male mice and um, um, we dosed the mice every, we started dosing the mice at three months um, using various behavioral experiments. We did the catwalk, uh, marble bearing, um, I think it's over here. Um, a few other behavioral tests to see whether or not the drug was effective. We also did a control with the saline, the dose, dosage of the mice for two mil, milligrams per kilo. Uh, the, and then we did the necropsy that four months. Um, the results were the drugs that were treated were significant. Um, results in the NOR, which was the novel object recognition. Um, so they are familiarized with an object and then the final test is seen if they're able to recognize the novel object or the um, previous familiar object. Um, another one we did was the Nestlet, which provided no particular um, data significant for us to analyze. But the one thing we did note was that they weren't at that point where they couldn't take care of themselves. And Marble Bear, we had a problem with their protocol. Um, we found out there was another paper suggesting that they have more time to play with the marbles. And when we first showed them the marbles, they had no idea what to do. They didn't know they had to bury it. So we hit that and we were able to go about that. Um, with the rest, mice recognition, um, with the saline, they continue to decline. In the NO2, it climbs and improves 
As for the 1911, it was scattered. And this is the nestlet scoring. We noticed that from the saline mice compared to the four month, it was a huge decline. Whereas the 1902, it improved and it had a huge spike at six weeks. Um, conclusion is that this will allow the study to go into the next stage of the research project, which is still being done at the University of Arizona in the Center for Innovation for Brain Science. Um, in the next two stages, they will be allowed to do human trials. And it has shown effective to slow the disease of, with patients who have early onset or middle onset Alzheimer's. My acknowledgements, uh, my grant, and my PI and the lab I was able to work with. Questions? It looks like we have a question from the chat um, or from one of the attendees. Could you put your question in the Q&A and then I could ask it? I mean, I, I have like a broad question more for you, less about this specific research, but where would you want to go next with this research or other research? What, what are you really excited about? So so the one thing I've talked to my PI about is the possibility of going into TBIs. I, I personally had a TBI and I know how it affects the brain personally. And it does the same thing because when you have a TBI, you never know how your brain's gonna react. You can easily pop back or you might have a disability or brain bleed. And this, this drug can possibly help improve people who have TBIs. So I'm, I'm interested in where this will go. I see, so you're very like motivated by trying to help people and help, um, you know, people with diseases and these sorts of things. Yeah. yeah that's wonderful. Um, anyone else have any questions? Oh, we have a question from the chat, which is from Khaled. Um, just, what was the M MOA or mechanism of action that you treated the mice with? Um, we, we first did, she first did tablets and then they noticed that they were unable to ingest it. So she ended up doing liquid dosage. Great. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa. Um, and I think our next speaker is Leanna King, who is um, a neuroscience grad, a PhD student in, uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, and take it away. Sweet. Uh, all right. I'll share my screen here. Uh, let's Okay, and just to double check, you guys can see my slides and not like the presenter view. Yep, we get the presenter. Okay, I get awesome. the presenter view. Yeah, we're seeing the presenter now. Oh. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, how about this? Now it's good. Sweet. All right. Um, okay, great. Uh, so yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Hestre, hello everyone. My name is Lena King and I'm a third year PhD student in the Cognitive Neuroanatomy Lab at UC Berkeley that is led by Dr. Kevin Weiner. And so today I'll be talking a bit about my work and how I got into the field of neuroanatomy and genetics and what this entails for other fields. Um, but before I get started, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to my tribes back at home in Oklahoma, the Seminole and Muscogee Creek Nation, and also my family. Um, I loved making this slide and having a part of my academic talk, which is really not something that I get to do every day. And I'm glad to see another Oklahoman here, Matt, who gave a great overview about the current political scene with tribal sovereignty in the state. Um, but to go back to the neuroscience, I actually knew this is what I wanted to study since high school from a psychology class that I took. And from that, I just got really interested in the brain. 
From there, I ended up going to NYU, and during my sophomore year, I began my first major research experience at the Social Neuroscience Lab, led by Dr. Dave Demodio. I spent about a year or so there doing typical undergraduate work, and then in my final year, I joined BU Hayes Lab that studied brain states and perceptual dynamics. This is my first real research experience where about for three to four years, I worked on a project from start to finish and eventually uh, was published in eLife. So after this, I became a bit more interested in neuroimaging and how MRI can be used to visualize the brain, which brought me to UC Berkeley. So after rotating in a few different neuroimaging labs, I ended up joining the Cognitive Neuroanatomy Lab where I actually really never thought about anatomy much before, but from working with Kevin and Jesse, who is a former postdoc in the lab, I realized how overlooked this field really is. And to give a brief overview, one of the main focuses is investigating the relevance of tertiary sulci in the brain, which are shallower and develop later in compared to primary sulci. And then also how these structures relate to cognition, um, the visual cortex and visual processing, and how genes may relate to these structures or the overall anatomy of the brain. And this is where my research comes in. So my focus in the lab is looking at how the human cerebral cortex is organized at the genetic level and how this relates to anatomy and subsequently function as well. That being said, at each of these levels of organization, we can infer different things about the brain. For example, at the functional level, there are many different parcelations made from functional imaging data on humans. On humans. And then as for anatomical organization, a lot of work was done in the early mid 1900s, looking at histological sections of the brain and a few more recently looking at anatomical neuroimaging data. Finally, underlying both of these modes of organization, there's also a genetic structure to the brain, which has recently become a growing field due to advances in genetic and transcriptomic sequencing methods, which is where my project comes in to investigate the question of how does gene expression contribute to the structure and function of the brain. So this is done by looking at the relationship between transcriptomic and anatomical features of the brain of, of the human cerebral cortex through the use of two publicly available data sets, one being the Allen Human Brain Atlas, which is a whole brain microarray data set of over 20,000 genes across roughly 3,700 samples taken from both cortical and subcortical structures. And then this is combined in a template space with the Zhu Brain Cytoarchitectonic Atlas, which is an observer independent parcellation that is made by identifying borders between areas in the brain based off their differences in cytoarchitecture, which is essentially the size, shape, and density across the cortical layers um, illustrated in the bottom right. So with these two data sets combined, we can generate average transcriptomic profiles within each cytoarchitectonic area, and then identify the top 1% of genes that are most differentially expressed across these areas with the use of principal component analysis. Um, then we generated these 200 gene transcriptomic profiles of each region. Uh, an example is shown in the lower left as V1 from the visual cortex with a radial plot that illustrates the relative expression of these 200 genes. Um, and then we use these fingerprints of each cortical region to determine their transcriptomic similarity or dissimilarity to other regions. So interestingly, we found that there are two main clusters, one illustrated in orange that primarily consists of regions within the cingulate and insular cortices, and the other one illustrated in green that contain the remainder of the cortical RIs. Additionally, when looking closer at the clustering within this multidimensional scaling, we saw that there are two types of genetic similarities, one showing within network cluster, within network clustering, which goes in line with the idea that regions that are close together in anatomical space are going to be more genetically similar than regions that are further apart. In this case, we have visual regions that cluster together in the dark green cluster in the lower right corner. And then we also show across network clustering, where regions that belong to the same network or hierarchical order are more genetically similar to one another than they are to their neighboring regions. So for example, we have the fusiform gyrus that's shown um, on the bottom left here that is broken down into four different areas with each belonging to a different subcluster. Um, and so ultimately these findings further support the notion that the brain is more heterogeneous in its genetic expression than originally thought. 
and the organization of the stream's friction is not solely based off anatomical location, but in regards to function as well. So with these findings in the adult brain, I then wanted to know where this genetic organization comes from. And then this is where we begin to see the relevance of the intersection between genes and anatomy on development. So looking at this question of how the brain is genetically organized, we're looking at an incredibly complex organ with billions of cells of all different kinds that arise from a single stem cell. And very briefly, what we know from animal research is that in early development, these are there are different sets of transcription factors and morphogens that localize different regions in the brain and the cerebral cortex. And in relation to anatomy, we also know that there's evidence in support of genes that can even localize an expression between sulcal and gyro regions of the cortical ribbon. So as for one of my future directions of my project, I aim to investigate this question of how genetic organization arises in adulthood using the Brainspan Developmental Atlas from the Allen Institute. This has been investigated previously in the visual cortex with work done in the lab by Jesse Gomez and Zong Zin, where they identified gradients of gene expression along the functional hierarchy of the visual cortex, illustrated on the very far right here. And then as you look across development, you see the most drastic difference in these gradients occurring between birth and five years. So based on these results, I expect to see similar findings um, in my future work when looking at all cortical regions where genetic gradients identified in adulthood change across development and likely that different sets of genes are gonna be responsible for patterning at different stages. Another aspect of my previous finding is the relation between genes and cognition, which there has been great talks already in regards to the field of genomics and the ethical considerations of this field. But here I'm gonna focus on a little bit of a different line of research which looks to examine the effects of genes directly on cognitive or behavioral phenotypes. So this relies on the notion that cognitive traits are inherited and the degree to which they are inherited is referred as heritability. And let's see. And then another growing field of this research focuses on the use of genome-wide association studies, which through extremely large sample sizes are able to correlate single nucleotide polymorphisms SNPs, so for example, changing A to a T in the genome, to the variability in a certain phenotype, whether that be a disease or a behavioral trait. However, this approach has several major limitations where these heritability measures or S&P correlations are influenced by essentially any envir environmental variable, many of which also have major ethical considerations. So recently, there has been a major increase in the CWAS studies on complex behavioral traits, such as intelligence, sexual behavior, self-regulation, addiction, just to name a few. And in particular, this most recent one has also garnered a lot of media attention with very leading headlines, such as how scientists are learning to predict your future with your DNA. Meanwhile, the GWA cited was done on traits that showed to have less than 10% heritability. So this brings about a lot of the challenge that come with heritability studies and genome-wide association studies. Whereas just mentioned, many of these studies, especially the ones looking at behavior, are dealing with phenotypes that have very low heritability values, typically anywhere between one to 20% of the actual variation observed, let alone bringing into consideration how these phenotypes are measured. Um, another major caveat of this research, which has already been touched on by Matt Anderson, is that many of the population samples used are white European descent, and the findings of this research can only be applied to that exact same demographic which has contributed to and is a lack of diversity in genomic research. And lastly, these GWAS studies that typically find hundreds, sometimes even thousands of associated genes, it's only a matter of time until every single gene has been associated with some sort of negative phenotype. So in contrast with the direct association between genes and cognition, and to sort of move away from that approach, my work focuses on the intersection of anatomy as an intermediate between these two fields where one of the goals of this work is to look at anatomical and genetic organization across different spatial scales and ultimately find a link or some anatomical features such as cellular density as a potential link between the organization at these different scales. So with that, I just wanted to end by saying thank you, Majo, uh, to the lab and my PI, Kevin Weiner, Jesse Gomez, who's now faculty at Princeton, and Zhang Lezin, who's one of our collaborators in Beijing, and of course, my two cats. Um, these seems to be really popular with thank you notes amongst us academics and researchers. So of course, I just want to include Fernie and Nima. 
Um, and then I also especially just wanted to thank the Full Circle Conference for hosting me for my very first academic talk. Um, very excited that I got to do this at an all Native and Indigenous led conference. And this has, you know, really been amazing. So props to everybody who organized this. Um, so yeah, with that, I guess um, I will take any questions. You have a question in the chat and a couple of questions uh, in, in the various chats, but I'll first have more of a comment. You killed it for your first talk. So great job. <laughs> you can Thank take you. your, your questions though. Uh, so in terms of controlling for environmental factors, the data sets that I'm using, they're post-mortem brains. Uh, so these are, you know, this genetic data, it comes from, you know, person who has already been deceased and in the adult set, it's a um, combined of six different brains. Uh, so not a lot, um, five of which are men, one is female. And it's kind of, you know, at this moment, this is the best data set that we have for this, but I think the Allen Institute is working on doing RNA sequencing data instead of bulk RNA data um, on different sets of brains. So hopefully we'll see this data set improve. And then same thing for the developmental atlas, also on postmortem brains. Um, that's kind of at this stage, we just kind of take it what we can get. Um, and then uh, let's see in the chat. Uh, yeah, so going into the data set from the Allen Institute, um, for the adult brains, three were white, two were Hispanic, and one was black. So not also, again, not the greatest variability, especially when you only have six brains to work with. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll see that this expands a little bit more now that they're working with RNA sequencing data, but that is still to be determined. Um, and then I think, okay, cool. I think I answered everybody's question. Um, and I, you know, want to keep us on track. So uh, I, I just have a quick question and, and yeah. it'll be very quick. How many brains would you need, you know, for, for like GWAS is you, you do it across large populations and then you don't even find anything significant. So, um, many times, so well, for genome-wide association studies, that's just DNA that's taken from, you know, um, anywhere between hundreds of thousands of people to a million people. So that way they can, you know, have the statistical power to find these correlations between these really small changes in the DNA. Um, so yes, that one, that's just looking at DNA in general taken from, you know, anybody. Um, but these, you know, kind of RNA sequencing data, or in this case, uh, bulk RNA sequencing data, you just, that has to come from, you um, postmortem tissue. So yeah, that's a little, little bit more difficult to get, but, but yeah. I guess I was more asking like about the power, like how many brains do you actually need to be able to say something with confidence? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so in this case, because of the 20,000 genes and across these six brains, there's like 3,700 samples. So that, you know, when you're looking um, just across the number of samples that are within the brain from these six different ones, that seems to be enough in terms of finding any significant correlations or any significantly expressed genes um, across all those samples. So, and, but another caveat of this is that, you know, it's not equal sampling across all six different individuals. So, you know, there are other groups that are also working with the Allen uh, data set to kind of find these pre-processing parameters to kind of control for any of those effects. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, there's another group that's been working on like a solidified pipeline in terms of working with this uh, data set. Cool, well, it seems like really important work. So thank you, um, Anna. Um, we'll switch over to our next speaker. There are a couple of comments and other questions in the chat as well that you can follow up on. Um, uh, yes. I can answer those um, in the chat. Yeah, all right. Shane Boomer is our next speaker who's coming from um, University of South Dakota. Um, yeah, have fun. All right, can everybody hear me? Yep. All right, very good. Um, all right, uh, my name is Shane Boomer. Uh, like was mentioned, uh, I'm in the University of South Dakota, first year medical or PhD student in basic biomedical sciences. Uh, this right here is the undergraduate work that I did at the University of South Dakota also. Uh, uh, it's called Cardio Sympathetic Afferent Reflex on PVN and Cardiovascular Function. And 
Okay, so for an introduction, uh, we kind of need to get into blood pressure control. Blood pressure control consistently changes throughout the day, depending on what you're doing, standing, sitting, uh, running away from a moose, uh, basically all that type of stuff. Uh, there's multiple mechanisms geared toward blood pressure control, uh, namely baroreceptors in the carotid sinus and aortic arch. The central nervous system input uh, regulates uh, various areas, uh, such as vascular resistance, the RAA system, and the brain is involved with these reflex control mechanisms. And for the CSAR, the cardiac sympathetic afferent reflex, uh, we stimulated this, uh, which I'll explain later in the approach. Um, we caused this stimulation, which would go to the paraventricular nucleus and the hypothalamus, which would then end up uh, increasing sympathetic tone, which causes an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, it was shown that uh, CSAR uh, is attenuated in the pathophysiology of heart failure and uh, chronic, uh, yeah, heart failure <laughs> and hypertension. As for the paraventricular nucleus, uh, the brain has multiple centers of coordination of autonomic activity, uh, namely the medulla and hypothalamus. Uh, the PVN is a specialized cluster of cells located uh, alongside the third ventricle. And um, the PVN has been shown to be critically involved in the central pathway of the CSAR. Uh, we stimulated the CSAR uh, reflex by uh, using bradykinin. Uh, other studies have used capsaicin, which I think uh, in my future studies will be using capsaicin on the renal sympathetic nerve activity. And then we assess the PVN using immunohistochemistry, which will also be shown later. Uh, one of the big things that we're going to look into was the sex differences in blood pressure control. Uh, men uh, generally have a more likely um, more likelihood of having a cardiovascular event that is up until uh, menopause occurs in females, then the uh, stats kind of align together. Uh, the premenopausal women uh, generally have a much lower event or risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, so what we're also going to look into is estrogen and testosterone receptors in the PVN, and both have direct linkages to that pre-autonomic neural regulation. As for the significance of our study, uh, millions of people have hypertension, and uh, as a result, um, they can suffer from various complications such as heart attack, stroke, renal failure, and these deficits in blood pressure control are a contributing factor. So if we can understand the potential differences in the CSAR, we may improve our understanding of uh, how we control blood pressure. And the goal of ours was to better develop an understanding of CSAR control of blood pressure in males versus females. As for our first surgical approach, so we use a rat model. Uh, once the rat was properly anesthetized, we um, opened the femoral triangle to where we could place catheter in the femoral vein of femoral artery. The femoral artery was used for blood pressure and heart rate uh, monitoring, while the femoral vein was used for uh, additional anesthetic that we needed throughout the rest of the surgeries. Um, those were secured, and then we could go on to our tracheal surgery where we placed the tracheostomy. Uh, for that, it was pretty important to maintain midline, so then you can avoid the large vessels. Uh, from there, all the tubes and catheters were secured and monitored. The tracheostomy is important because once you open the chest, which I'll get to in the next slide, uh, you lose that negative pressure driving ventilation. So then we would be able to uh, pretty much keep, keep oxygen flowing throughout our subject. And now for our cardiothoracic surgical approach, what we did was we entered the rat on its left side 
at about the fourth intercostal space. There is blunt dissection through three different muscle groups. And we use lidocaine as a topical anesthetic um, as an adjunct to our general anesthesia with the uh, uh, urethane chlorolose. And so as we enter the thoracic cavity, we lost the respiratory drive, which then we uh, used mechanical ventilation. From there, we could visualize the thymus gland, which is a very fragile gray little organ that sits top of the heart. Uh, we retract that and we're able to visualize the pericardial sac. From there, we are able to place a PE10 catheter. The PE10 catheter is at a 90 degree angle. So then we can pretty much let it lie right along the left ventricle. And there's also many holes in the PE10 catheter to allow for a wider dispersal of our, um, either the saline that we gave or the bradykinin. Uh, once we did that, we uh, placed some glue on the PE10 catheter and then closed the chest, made sure that everything pretty much stayed where it was supposed to stay. And then we let the rat sit for about 30 minutes to make sure that there was no uh, rapid decline. Uh, oftentimes you would have to use a needle and needle decompress the chest to get rid of excess air to allow for a proper expansion of the lung. And while after that 30 minutes is up, then we could start uh, delivering our uh, negative control and our drug. So for our negative control, we use room temperature saline. Uh, that is to the left here, this red arrow, the top uh, measurement is blood pressure while the bottom measurement is heart rate. So as you can see, as the pericardial saline vehicle was injected, there's pretty much little to no response. Um, oftentimes you can see a very slight um, drop in blood pressure as some sort of a, para or a parasympathetic response to the uh, room temperature saline. Um, and then from there, we wait between 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can deliver our bradykinin, which as you can see here on the right, we gave it at a concentration of 10 uh, micrograms per kilogram per 0 0.1 milliliters. And so from that, you can see that there was a uh, great increase in the blood pressure and heart rate. And this was shown throughout all our subjects. So for immunohistochemistry, we, once we sacked the animal, we retrieved its brain and then was able to section it and then do immunohistochemistry, which we'll show here in the next slide, I believe. Oh, here's the results of the, <clears throat> the first part with the CSAR response. So males were shown to have 24 plus or minus four millimeters of mercury increase while the females showed an 18 plus or minus two millimeters of mercury. And that is shown to the top right here while the top or the bottom right is more of a time course. And you can see this pretty much the same results with the heart rate. The males were 20 plus or minus six beats per minute while the females were 12 plus or minus four. And the males generally had a longer response compared to the females. And here are the pretty pictures we got with the immunohistochemistry. And so we used CFOS to measure the uh, activity within. So right here is the third ventricle. You can see the CFOS. And then we also use DAPI as a co-stain for nuclear uh, staining. What we expected to see is CFOS and DAPI overline. So the left two pictures are female and the right three pictures are male. As you can see, there's kind of more staining with uh, this male as there is with the female, but we didn't do any analysis on uh, the number of cells that were activated or stained. And then as for summary and conclusions, well, we've shown that the bradykinin into the pericardial space on the left ventricle increased both blood pressure and heart rate, which was not observed with the saline vehicle. Uh, 
while it appeared qualitatively greater in males compared to females, there was no uh, significance with statistical analysis. The bradykinin administration increased the CFOS in the PVN in males and females. And while there were attempts to find androgen and estrogen receptors, uh, we weren't able to get conclusive evidence. We either had no staining or we had a lot of non-specific binding. And we concluded that the responses to activation of CSCR was appeared to be modulated by sex, but there was no statistical analysis or but statistical analysis showed that no significance at this time. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Doug Martin. He was my lead for my thesis committee. Uh, Dr. Yifan Lee and Dr. Hong Zhang. Dr. Hong Zhang is my uh, advisor for graduate school now and will be working on renal sympathetic nerve activity. I would also like to thank the National Institute of Health for uh, the funding grant and also my laboratory coworkers who are grad students, undergrad technicians, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Shane. So, so I, I have more of like a big, big picture question. You're, you're there at University of South Dakota um, and, and from my, I, I know um, Megan Redshirt Shaw, who's there, who runs a lot of Native American programs. Are you involved in any of those? Have, have you found those helpful? I was in undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, as for graduate school, I was, I'm not uh, as uh, involved, I guess. Yeah, I see. So it's more for, those programs are more for undergrads than for folks. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, a uh, question from the chat is, will you be continuing to expand upon this work in your PhD? Um, I will actually be uh, transitioning from the heart to the kidneys. So um, I mentioned that um, I'd be looking into renal sympathetic nerve activity. And so it kind of all plays pretty much the same stuff, but different. Uh, it's, we're, Starting that now, pretty much, I'm doing lab rotations, and then I believe next semester I'll be really getting into the bulk of uh, my surgeries and all that. Very cool. What What are you most excited about? Um, I I uh, really like the surgeries. It's so much fun. Um, like for me, um, I'm also a paramedic uh, back in Pine Ridge, and so. I kind of get that uh, physiological approach and uh, it's a pretty big thing for me. I like it a lot. <laughs> Wonderful. I think kind of like tying into that, Maggie wants to know, did your experience growing up help you um, with what you're doing now? Um, uh, so I grew up on a ranch and so we did a lot of stuff with, you know, baby cows and all that. and. Uh, we had a lot of horses and so just being with them and like helping when they're sick really got me into wanting to be uh, in the biomedical sciences and so I think that was pretty much a big factor uh, I realized I didn't really want to be a vet so <laughs> I kind of transitioned from that into uh, more of a research type approach Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Shane, for, for sharing and, and being here with us. Um, we're going to transition to our next speaker, um, Jesse Holt. Um, you want to share your slide? Jesse, of course, helped us organize this event, and he's a dear friend of mine who I've known for a bit. And I'm really happy to hear him give a talk on his work on the Nobel Prize winning Piezo One. So, you know, we. Awesome. Anyways, well, Jesse's a wonderful person too, so take it away. <laughs> I don't know about that, but thank you, Willow. Um, I, everyone, I am hoping you can see my slides, right? We can. Cool. The actual slides, not the, not the interview? Yes. Um, cool. <laughs> All right. Just making sure, because you said yes before, and that was not a correct yes. Um, I know, I was so. wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the peer review. 
Yep, you're all gum. I don't trust you. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Me uh, and Jesse Holt, no Tash, Yusi Irvine Yam, no Hashemin, Pitu no 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 Arvi, no no Piquas E Life. Hey everyone, my name is Jesse Holt. I am a PhD student from UC Irvine, and I'm a member of the Hashem Nation. And I'm going to tell you a story we recently published in E Life. This was performed in collaboration with the Script Research Institute, which is on the Kumai Nation. And as I mentioned, I come from UCI, which is located on the shared territories of the Hashim and Tongva people. And I've been proud to continue the history of my ancestors by pursuing my PhD on our traditional lands and continue in the path as a caretaker of our, uh, of, of our lands. And I exist, I just, before we, I begin in my research, I want to note that I'm one of the few Native grad students here within the UCI School of Medicine. And last year, when uh, universities all across the US were pledging to do more from BIPOC peoples, I uh, wrote an open letter because I was upset that our university, despite being very well meaning, they and using an encompassing term like BIPOC uh, to promise to do better. When you read through their goals and their initiatives to do better, you could tell that BIPOC was actually in sole reference to the Black student populations. And BIPOC isn't the best term. It still has some erasure in, involved into it, but it's supposed to highlight the ex shared experiences of Black and Indigenous peoples. And by not centering Indigenous voices in their goals, they continue to contribute to the erasure and visibility of Indigenous peoples, which is something we've been broadly uh, subjected to. And my letter urged for them to do more and do better and increase the number of indigenous and native scientific role models. And it ruffles some branches, but I think one of the most beautiful things that's come from this is the organization of this uh, conference. It led me to, or Willow and I to start talking uh, about how we need to do uh, more. And yeah, I thank everyone for coming to my talk and for coming to our conference and for supporting it. I appreciate you all. Um, but yeah, so let me get into this. So. I study skin and uh, piezo one's function skin. Now, skin is the largest organ of the body. It's outermost layer, the epidermis, is composed of keratinocytes. And these form that protective barrier of skin, keeping you safe from disease and infection. And in the event of an injury, your body sets up a complex orchestration of events as it works to repair and heal this damaged tissue. Now, a hallmark of the healing process involves migration where the keratinocytes, at the wound edge will migrate into the wound bed to close that epithelial barrier or close that wound and reestablish the epithelial barrier. Recent studies have shown that mechanical cues detected by these cells, the keratinocytes play an important role in regulating healing. However, the molecular identity of the mechanosensor which guided this migration process had remained largely unknown. So in Compiezo, which is a family of mechanically activated ion channels, so they're opened by mechanical force, and these were identified by our collaborators, the Patapudian group. And as Willa mentioned, they were recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology, Physiology and Medicine. And they play an important role in regulating a variety of biological processes, including those that I've highlighted here, stem cell differentiation, vascular development, and bladder mechanical sensation are just to name a few. And while piezo one had been looked at in regulating other skin functions, the role of piezo one in regulating healing and keratinocyte migration had not really been explored. So we asked if piezo one might act as a mechanosensor, which regulates wound healing during uh, the reepithelialization process. And to do this, we used turf microscopy, which we previously reported we were able to use it to visualize piezo activity in cells loaded with a calcium indicator. So in the absence of external forces or external stimulation, we saw that cell types like fibroblasts and neural stem cells show this spontaneous uh, piezo-dependent flicker activity, which you can see here in this video. And we generated a skin-specific knockout mouse where there's no piezo-1 expression in the keratinocytes. And when we use that turf microscopy technique to image calcium flickers in these cells, we see that we get a significant reduction in flicker activity in the knockout cells due to the lack of piezo-1. We also generated a skin-specific gain of function mouse where piezo activity is increased. And when we use turf to measure channel activity and character sites from these mice, you can see that there's an increase in the flicker, the number of flickers, indicating that there's an increase in this piezo one ion channel activity. To look at the function of piezo one during wound healing, we made wounds in the skins of piezo one mutant mice and control 
and respective litter mates and the measured wound areas. Six days after wounding, we saw that knockout mice had smaller wound areas than control, while gain of function mice had larger wound areas, indicating that piezo activity decreased the rate of wound healing. And reduced piezo one caused wounds to heal faster. So determine that this rate of healing is caused by a change in keratinocyte migration. We generate scratch wounds in model layers, isolated keratinocytes of isolated keratinocytes and measure the change in scratch area over time. And replicating our results, we see that knockout model layers close their scratches faster than control, while gain of function cells or cells treated with a Yoda-1, a drug that activates piezo one had scratches that close significantly slower. And to investigate if this effect was due to effect on keratinocyte migration, we performed a single cell tracking assay where we were able to track uh, the position of individually migrating cells and quantify any differences in locomotion between conditions. And we see that um, if we look at mean squared displacement, which is a measure of the surface area explored by cells, we can see that knockout keratinocytes explore a larger area compared to control. And MSD, or the mean squared displacement, is determined by two parameters, the straightness of a cell, which can be determined by the directional persistence, and speed. So we see that knockout cells migrate farther because they migrate both straighter and faster than controls, while gain of function cells migrate slower relative to controls. Thus showing that piezo one affects reepithelialization or wound healing by altering cell speed so that knockout cells migrate faster while gain of function cells migrate slower. To really gain insights to how piezo one might regulate cell migration, we wanted to visualize the spatial dynamics of piezo during migration. And so we used a TD tomato knock and reporter mouse where the channels expressed as a TD tomato fusion protein to visualize where the channel is in the cell. By directly imaging piezo-1's location in live migrating cells, we see that this channel is enriched at the trailing end of these migrating cells, suggesting that the channel might be, or underlies cell polarization during migration. To determine whether piezo-1 might play a role in generating this polarized shape during our time-lapse experiments, we segmented cell shapes and used a machine learning algorithm to classify them. And we found that our data set had 20 distinct shape modes, and we could further class classify them through this algorithm into three uh, classes in terms of polarization. This weakly polarized, polarized, and hyperpolarized. And we found that by knocking out piezo one, we significantly reduced the proportion of cell shapes that are polarized. You can see here, we get a significant increase in the knockout cells that are weakly polarized. And then this is just the, uh, the the all these bars added up and so you can see knockout are increasingly weakly polarized and on the other hand in the gain function mutation cells we see that piezo activity increases the percentage that are hyperpolarized and polarized indicating that piezo one activity promotes the cell polarized shape and we wanted to know what the spatial organization of piezo one is in wounded monolayers in these uh, where the cells are all together instead of individual like we saw before. And we see that in some fields of view, we get this enrichment. And in some fields of view, there's this clear lack of enrichment. And if we track these fields over time, we saw that in fields of view, which don't have this enrichment, the monolayer edge migrates cleanly forward to go on and heal the wound. Whereas in fields that develop this enrichment, we see a significant retraction of the wound edge. You can see that this enrichment pops up and we get that retraction. And then this really ebbed and flowed over time. It's very dynamic. You can see here the, the wound edge of cells migrates forward, the enrichment appears, and we begin to get this retraction. The enrichment begins to fade, and then we move back forward. We utilize a deep learning app algorithm to detect this puncta movement and quantify our data. And we saw that this enrichment is correlated with edge retraction. So we then wanted to know whether channel activation might cause subtle changes to cell dynamics. And that might lead to those gross effects on motility and monolayer movement. So we monitored keratin sites migrating under control solution and in solution containing the piezo one drug agonist Yoda-1. And we saw that upon addition to Yoda-1, we get a uh, increase in cell dynamics. I think the video is going to be pretty slow. I apologize for that. But if we go to the next page, um, we used chymographs to visualize the cell edge over the course of the imaging period. So this allowed us to make a line like so. And we could visualize the changes at the single position in the field of view over time. And so you can see here in control solutions, it was very 
uh, smooth cycles of attraction. And then when we add Yoda one, the edge gets extremely dynamic. We get an increase in retraction as indicated by the increase in frequency over here. And we also get an increase in the velocity of these retractions. And then when we do the same test in the knockout keratinocytes, we fail to see any effect on the edge dynamics, indicating that this uh, was mediated by piezo one. Uh, to more systematically investigate this effect, uh, we used a computer vision algorithm to segment each frame of a time lapse series. And so we were able to time lapse, segment the time lapse series. And then we could visualize the cell edge over time. And you can see here the under control conditions on the left, uh, it was very cleanly, clean cycle. And then under Yoda one, it was increasingly dynamic. Um, leading our conclusion that piezo one increases set edge retraction. And um, we then asked how these retraction events are relevant to wounded monolayers. And we see that in scratch monolayers, we get um, when they're treated with Yoda one, they have this high increase of retraction, which impede their ability to migrate forward into the cell free space. My video is very frozen and I apologize for that. But on the left, you would see the monolayer migrates forward, right? You get an impediment, thus indicating that piezo activity increases retraction, um, impeding cell speed and promoting healing. And then with that, I would like to uh, go to my acknowledgments. I would like to thank my advisor, Veda Pathak, uh, and everyone I listed here. Uh, Soon provided the initial identification of the phenotype. Wei Zhang initiated our collaboration with the Patapudian lab. And yeah, I know I'm out of time, but I can answer any questions with the uh, in the chat. You have uh, two questions right now. Um, one is I, I, I want to address the one from Chrissy Redhorse just because I want to highlight her. She's an HHMI investigator and she's native. She's probably the first one. That's incredible. Anyways, um, uh, yeah, her question is beautiful work. I was surprised that piezo inhibits wound healing speed. Is the quality of the faster repairing wound compromised? That is a very good question and something we were very interested in checking. When we performed uh, uh, H&E staining and to look at the uh, quality of wound healing, we actually saw that there was really no effect on scarring. Um, we would need in the, between the knockouts and the control. So we would need to perform a more systematic approach to looking at the healing uh, efficacy. But as of right now, we don't really see a, um, a difference in the healing. But yes, it was a very surprising result. All right, we're going to switch over to our next speaker. Um, but thanks, Jesse. There's another question in the chat for you. Um, and thanks for everything and helping organizing the event. Um, our next speaker is, um, is Kealu Fox, who's um, we're really happy to have as a professor at UC San Diego. And as Matt said yesterday, is everywhere when it comes to um, data sovereignty and genetics. So, um, Kialu, why don't you take it away? Hello. Aloha. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just uh, setting up my thing. One, 30 seconds. No worries. Take your time. All right, aloha. Thank you so much, Olonui, for inviting me. I also noticed that you have back-to-back -back Kanakas presenting, which is outstanding. I see Professor is here and so many lovely faces. And can I do, I can share my screen? Okay. Yeah, you should be able to. Okay, let's begin. 
thank you so much again. Um, I've titled this talk, Data as Power, the Next 100 Generations of Indigenous Data Sovereignty. I think it's really important for the next generation of scientists to think about where, where their data ends up, how it's protected, and what types of narratives the data we generate is used to propagate. What type of science do we promote using the development uh, of a lot of these different techniques? For me, as a genome scientist, it usually centers around human genome sequence data, which is a really powerful form of data. We can dig deeply back into the past, the deep past, and understand our migratory history and diaspora. <clears throat> we can also think about our susceptibility to disease and engage and empower and enable predictive medicine, preventative medicine, personalized medicine, all the Ps. Um, but I think one of the most important pieces is that those two perspectives, what is medically actionable and what we use to determine and influence and understand and repatriate our history, they're one and the same. They're the same thing. We like to separate them in medical schools all over the world and anthropology departments all over the world. And I want to dig into that and the history of that and just talk about what that means and how powerful some of our data can be. I am from Pololu. This is in North Kohala on the big island of Hawaii. This is where my family's from. We now have a homestead and live in an area called Hilo, North Hilo. Many of you are probably familiar with it. <clears throat> and this is a more modernized look at our diaspora throughout the Pacific. And many of you probably know, we have a rich history of voyaging. We have a rich history of being the greatest navigators in human history. And we found some of the most remote places in the world like Hawaii, Tahiti, and Rapa Nui, Aotearoa. And we did that using really sophisticated uh, forms of science and the scientific method and aggregating and thinking about our observations, bird migration patterns, using the celestial sphere at night, um, all types of environmental sources of information that allowed us to find these places, but not only find them and thrive and bring horticulture systems and agriculture systems in one of the most remarkable uh, diasporas in human history, covering the span of Europe plus Asia in less than 1000 years. Um, but before we could speak for ourselves and our accomplishments, we had others discrediting what we had accomplished, assuming that we came from the opposite direction. This is a map from Thor Heyerdahl's Contiki showing, and he was predicting that we came from South America, which is not true. Uh, we have all kinds of evidence supporting that our ancestors made it to South America and came back, but this is exactly not what happened. Uh, and this he, here you can see happened in the 1940s, 1947 to be specific. Um, you then have one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen in my life on the left. This is when Hokulea arrives in Tahiti in 1976. And you can see all of the just thrilled and excited and proud Polynesian people on this boat, um, just in amazement of the accomplishment of our people and the birth of experimental archaeology and what um, many of the best sailors in history have, have accomplished. And that is the birth of the Hawaiian Renaissance. And that is the birth of a lot of our our pride in, in, in what we had proved. Um, and here's a picture of Hokulea on the right. Um, I was privileged enough, and one of the reasons I got into genetics was to use modern genomic information from our communities in a way to empower our voyaging history. And here's a paper we recently published in the journal Nature, not any of the small ones, the big one and it's called Paths and Timing of the People of Polynesia Infirm, uh, Inferred from Genomic Networks. And this was a really important moment as my, in my career as a scientist because I knew this was possible. I knew that everyone else that was really thinking about archaeology was not from our culture. 
They didn't empower our culture in ways where they used the names that we call our islands and ways that really privilege our accomplishments as voyaging people. And you can see that, and we have uh, a lot of different bifurcation events that happen. And obviously this is not perfect, everyone, but this is a, a fantastic attempt to use modern genomic information to understand our diaspora and our history. You should also note that we can use this exact same information to think about our susceptibility to disease. I won't be talking about that today, but I just wanted to say that it was a huge privilege to work on a project like this that's at least 10 years in the making and publish it in the largest journal in the world. But you can't control the media. And sometimes you can't control what people say. And another, no matter what we do sometimes, this is a, a headline that was in the journal Science, Someone said, no one could have predicted. DNA offers surprises on how pollen. Listen, we knew we did this. We said we did this. Uh, we recapitulated the voyaging journey in 1976. We were certain that we were going to see this in our DNA. Um, but still, you get um, narratives that you can't control. Um, other media outlets were a lot more gracious and empowering. 5,000 years ago, a group of people left Taiwan and changed the world. That's a little more accurate. But if you're unhappy with the narratives, and I just want to encourage the students, write your own. Go to the media outlets that you would want children and youngsters to read and write your own. And this is exactly what I did. I took that challenge into my own hands and my keyboard, and I wrote an opinion piece for Scientific American. I even put uh, Keokaha on and the Kiakahi Ba'a, this boat. This is one that I see all the time in my own neighborhood. And we, we got to really discuss. Things. It seems once more that we've lost uh, a speaker, but um, I'm sure Kaolu will be back and we can continue on with our rapt attention. You're back. Sorry about that. I got kicked out. Um, start over from, from the beginning, right? No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We just push everything back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me um, screen share again. I apologize. No worries. I can't control the, the interwebs. Yeah, how's that? All right, we'll get back to it. I'll be speedy too. No worries. Yeah. Okay, so we're working on a lot of point of care, community based projects on health initiatives that have been prioritized by communities in the Pacific. One of them is gout, and we're experimenting the use of different mobile diagnostic technologies to think about one, black, de black boxing the way technologies work and creating transparency about the way, the tools in which we generate data. That's a really important piece. And when we think about technological independence and democratization of tools, this is uh, in stark contrast to and disrupt to the way which we uh, traditionally in research and medicine have just extracted biological sources, taken it away and ferried it away to the Cambridges and the Palo Altos and the La Jolla's and uh, made data and never really, you know, uh, justify that in different ways. That creates trust uh, for a lot of good reasons, but but there are alternatives to that and that is a lot of the projects that we're working on now. Um, we're exploring the use of 
mobile smart fins for thinking about the climate crisis and bacterial genomics, mobile ultrasound, and using that, it can connect directly to your smartphone and you can create diagnostics from everything from thyroid cancer to heart murmurs. And then um, a lot of the early stuff and entry point for point technology for myself was thinking about and design algorithms for mobile genome sequencing. But the rest of this talk is going to focus on our history and an exhibit that we created with the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. And this is a museum I've been going to since I was a child. If any of you have been to Honolulu, I'm sure you've been here. It's a really special place, but it is not a perfect place. And I'll explain that. Um, we entitled our exhibit Regenerations, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii, because Bishop Museum and many natural history museums have a history of being complicit in eugenic research. And that's why you see this caliper here, because measurement theory of the past was a way to hierarchically and scientifically inform racism. Um, this was a really sensitive exhibit to build and I'll explain why that's important and how important it is to create community consensus and co-design everything with community members, especially ones that have been disproportionately affected by scientific racism. But uh, we were gracious or, or, or lucky enough to receive a lot of positive pr uh, press, including the New York Times, Honolulu Magazine and, and many other places. And you can check out some of that stuff if you're into it. The exhibit is now going online, so they're transitioning a lot of the stuff here. You can see these two images. Um, the inspiration for this exhibit was finding a collection of photographs from an individual by the name of Lewis Sullivan, who was an active eugenics researcher. And we used those images and connected them in a very deliberate way to the living descendants and community members within the Kanaka Maldi or, or Hawaiian community through the development of this exhibit. And I'll explain how that kind of worked and what that looks like. <clears throat> and here are me and my co-curators, Leah Caldera and, and Jillian Swift. Incredible Manawahine, wouldn't be possible without the family members that contributed their insights into the co-development of this and these two industrious, hardworking women. And this is on the opening day of our exhibit. And you can see this beautiful Anue Anue, which was an auspicious omen. But we had a lot of things to contend with as we built the, the exhibit. Um, I started as a professor right before the pandemic. We had a range of different projects. We had to pivot in 110 different ways, just like many of you had to change the course of your lives and lifestyles and the way you integrate, engage with your communities uh, because of COVID. We did a lot of this communication just like we are right now over Zoom, uh, which changed a lot of our interaction. It also helped us get organized in certain ways. Um, and to highlight the, the importance of talking about social stratification and racism on January, January 6, we had some very, very active white supremacists attempting to siege the White House. So that gave us a lot of motivation and really helped us couch our worldview and the things that we put um, and created in the exhibit uh, so that the public could understand where we're coming from. The, one of the main themes from this exhibit is that the anthropology of the past, you know, phrenology and measurement theory is not that different from the anthropology and the human genetics of the of the future and the and the right now. Um, and if you're squeamish about bones and things, I'm going to tell you that there are a few images coming up and that you should kind of turn away. Um, and that goes for the recording of this as well. Uh, a lot of human remains are being transitioned into these are ancestors that are being ground up into bone dust DNA is being extracted. It is then being sequenced. Um, and a lot of this is happening without the consent of the lineal communities that are connected to those remains. Additionally, we have issues with provenance. And if you're not familiar with that word, it means where and how many of our ancestors ended up in cold steel drawers and freezers in the first place. 
And a lot of that has to do with a violent connection of, con of colonialism and biocolonialism. And that's the only way we can say it. Oh, excuse me. Um, these are some of those images in that collection of the Lewis, um, which is going on right now in front of us at a frenzied pace. And it's that, is this new field revealing new truths or falling into old traps? Are we really shining a light onto this higher resolution understanding of our deep history? Have we, do, you know, have we identified, intergressed Neanderthal DNA in our genomes and do we understand more about the history of agriculture and potentially disease? Yeah, we do. But at what cost and at what scale? And have we actually been building projects in a sustainable way with the communities that are the descendants to many of these ancestors? And it is going on at a frenzied pace, as I've said. So here we have a paper that just came out sequencing the genome of sitting bull's hair. I personally, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I, this is a place of love. I personally denied this paper at the highest level and they found a way to publish it. Um, and truthfully, there was nothing novel scientifically about it. There was no new method. There was no new algorithm that was developed. And it's unfortunate that it ended up in a journal in the way that it did. You also see now ancient DNA researchers are setting ethics guidelines of their work. You know, this is funny because within our Sing network, we have been singing at the mountaintop and putting out the playbook to do more sustainable research, including multiple papers in the biggest journals in the world. And so when you see other investigators window dressing ethics or using it as a tool to get the things that they want, but not actually acquiescing and changing their behavior and worldview and not actually engaging with the communities that they're supposed to, it comes off as superficial and it's really disappointing from our point of view. And we will be doing much more about that. I understand that this conference is funded by HHMI and you have several Gilliam fellows here. It is embarrassing to continue to fund David Reich's research program when you could break up his HHMI funding per year into creating four more research fellowships for indigenous people that come from communities that will do better work that will, will actually empower indigenous communities instead of disrespecting us and violating our human rights. There is a bone bonanza going on. More ancient genomes have been sequenced since 2018 than in the entirety of history. And this is causing a lot of interest and generation of data, but also there's not enough time that has elapsed for us to actually have honest consensus building with communities. Uh, on top of that, to make matters a bit more complex, you have the emergence of and the construction of more ancient DNA laboratories. So in red, you can see this is work that uh, I've published in the SAA record. The previous piece was in Nature, just showing that there are a lot more laboratories that require an ancient genomics workflow. They require the destruction of remains and the generation of data. And that leads us to a new position that we've not really been in before. I love this cartoon because it shows an archeologist looking down at their excavation pit and there's nothing there. And this speaks to the idea that ancient DNA and remains are a finite resource. So when you have more labs that require that, they require uh, the destruction of, of more DNA and it's, it, it kind of panders towards this anxiety for discovery. You can't just publish one ancient genome. Now you have to publish 800 and so on. Um, to make matters even more complex, Christie, Sotheby's, Instagram, and many, many other internet marketplaces are happy to sell ancient remains to the highest bidder. And that's exactly what's happening online. And it's quite disturbing. Um, and I wanted to bring this to the attention of many of you, and we brought this to the attention of people in our exhibit that we created. And that spawned our interest in thinking about deterrent technologies, counter technologies, and safeguarding technologies. And 
we entered into MIT Solve. We made it into the finals and we won a uh, community fellowship award based on designing new technologies to safeguard indigenous DNA. And here are some of our team members um, from various places, a lot of folks, a very inter interdisciplinary team, including geneticists, archeologists, ethicists, lawyers, um, algorithm developers, it was a lot of fun. And we got to think about what the future of designing deterrent technologies to pre protect our ancestors looks like. One of them is using blockchain technologies or digital ledger systems to create metadata signatures that are associated with experiments. So what do I mean? If you conduct an experiment where something weighs a gram and now it weighs 0.7 grams, all of that data should be publicly available if the experiment was a negative result, right? You should have timestamps that are associated with this. We should create transparency around which museums are in charge of what collections of ancestors remains and what is their provenance. We also used uh, a number of machine learning and computer vision techniques to train algorithms to identify um, networks of illicit trade on places like Instagram, for example. So if you're squeamish, there are a lot of different photos, but this is sort of a mosaic of many of the different images of human skulls that you can find on Instagram and using this and kind of training an algorithm to look for, for example, asymmetries and other things you can find uh, networks of people that are involved in basically selling ancient remains online. You can even go into the comment section and see how they negotiate and what types of keywords and code words they use to broker a lot of these deals. And that brings us to commodification. Uh, DNA is a resource, just like timber, oil, uh, diamonds, and everything else. Most importantly, it is it falls neatly into the big data surveillance ecosystem. And because of that, you can imagine that it is now the number one resource on planet Earth, surpassing oil in 2018. So when 23 and Me in 2018 sells access to their database to Glasgow Smith uh, Klein for $300 million to develop a number of drugs, you have to ask yourself, why did I pay them $150 to tell me things I already knew about myself, where I'm from, and so on. Then in 2020, we see the, the, the rise in the value of, of DNA and you see because Blackstone acquired Ancestry.com for $4.7 billion, meaning this data isn't just valuable, its value has increased over the last two to three years. And because of that, we touched on many of those ideas. Our uh, lawyer who we consulted with in the development of this project told us that if we use the actual names of 23andMe and, and uh, Ancestry, that it might, you know, we might get sued. So we created a fake company to get a lot of these points across called the Biocolonialism Trust. And it was a lot of fun. Um, here you have some of the fake products that uh, our master fabricator for the development of the exhibit put together. One of them says DNA in a box. Tell us, trust us to tell you who you are. And so we wanted to bring that to the attention of many of our exhibit goers and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. We also played with this idea about the ubiquity of technology. Uh, as I said at the top of the talk, you can bring mobile technologies into indigenous communities. You can de-black box how they work, but there's also a sort of darker side to the ubiquity of them because now you can imagine people bringing in mobile technology and kind of skirting regulation in new ways and collecting data. We, uh, and so we have a mobile genome sequencer, mobile PCR, cell phone, and a uh, UV power tab. And hey, Willow, how am I doing on time? You're uh, you're nearing your end. I was about to tell you that. So okay. good, good intuition. Okay. Uh, all <laughs> you're, right. I'll... You're about at the end. So. so we also talked about consent and how important consent is. And we explored the idea of writing a really, really terrible consent form and what that would mean and how that's contrast with engaging communities and writing consent forms in their language in Hawaiian, for example, or Tahitian. 
Um, I'll just skip past this stuff. And I'll tell you that there are a lot of other issues in genomics when it is related to health. And many of you know that there's a dearth of diversity and when it comes to fully understanding the, the full spectrum of human genetic variation. This is data from the GWAS Diversity Monitor, which is a really cool uh, website from Melinda Mills. I think she's at Oxford or Cambridge, one of those. And you can see that, uh, that as of today, 83% of GWAS studies have exclusively featured individuals of European descent. But what's more interesting, and I think problematic, is that 72% of these genetic discoveries have taken places in three countries. Meaning there's a particular worldview that's involved in biasing the analysis of all of this information, whether that's how it's plugged into a polygenic risk score, uh, you know, evaluation and many, many other things. And you can see how that's problematic because people from three countries are generating data and that doesn't allow for as much agency as we would like. Um, I'll just move on and say a lot of this data is being integrated directly into carceral technology. There was an incredible paper in Nature this week about the Roma communities in Europe and how uh, their, their genomic information is being directly embedded into carceral technology to ensure that many, many more of them are being uh, locked up in prison. And here you have the re-education camps in, in China. I read this piece in the camps, China's high-tech penal colony recently. It is harrowing. They are embedding and connecting facial recognition technology with human genome sequencing technology to basically force generations of people into re-education camps because of their spiritual predilection for Islam. And this is not a future that we wanna see. So indigenous data sovereignty, and I'll be brief, uh, provides us an opportunity to build the future within our communities. Data is power. We know that's the number one resource on planet earth many different institutions are recognizing this for different reasons. Uh, economically, uh, connecting it to indigenous rights, thinking about, you know, digital best practices and how it converges with all of these different types of technologies that I've tried to highlight today. And what's the future? Well, the future is indigenous futurism. We have been practicing this in Hawaii. Uh, we, for some time, we've been thinking about this. We had electricity and Eleni Palace, well before the White House. Repatriation, that's what that looks like. Um, enhancing ethical genomics research with communities. It's a privilege to, to get to publish these types of paper with papers with people like Matt, Renee, Nanaba, and Katrina. Uh, vertical integration of technologies, very important. Understanding the stacks of technologies that are involved from the satellites all the way to biospecimen containment centers, um, creating institutions like the Native Biodata Consortia, where we um, are building vertical integration of many of these different technologies. And this is uh, some of our team members and founders. There's no substitute for grassroots research or democratizing technology. Empowering the next generation is really important. Uh, Matt yesterday briefly talked about Indigidata, and we will be continuing to train the next generation of students and just viewing our science through an indigenous lens versus a racist lens and what that means. Finally, um, we are giving away seed grants for indigenous futurism that are focused on climate resilience. If you'd like to imply, apply, please apply. I encourage you to on experiment.com slash grants slash indigenous futurism. And we have a bunch of different sponsors that have matched uh, our our funding opportunities and just reach out to me if you're interested in this and thank you so much for your time. Thanks. That was uh, really powerful. Um, I think, unfortunately, we want need to move on to Rosie's talk. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have lots of discussion here and I, and I hope you can join us for the discussion later, the panel discussion. And I, I think your wisdom would be helpful there to with with everyone else. Um, you know what time that is, Willa? The panel? Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, uh, shoot. 12.30. 12.30? Oh, yeah. okay, perfect.
Cool. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> all right. I'm really happy to um, introduce Rosie uh, Aligato. Um, I think I, I, I'm just really excited to hear a native Hawaiian who's at University of Hawaii um, give a talk on her research. And she's been doing really inspiring research work and um, uh, my understanding on, on coanoflagellates and studying the origins of multicellularity from Nicole King's lab previously, and then also um, doing amazing activism work as well. Um, so yeah, please, I, I'm really excited to hear about what you're doing. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you, you can hear me and see me quite well? It's okay? Yeah, you're great. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to mahalo ke olu for providing um, and just setting the tone for the seriousness with which we have to approach our data, I think, and our science. I hadn't planned on doing this, but I think for me, seeing all of that felt really heavy. And so um, I, I think it's really important maybe that we kind of um, find a way to recenter ourselves around those discussions because they're very, very deep and um, and we need to really think about and remember our ancestors and all of that. So I wanted to share with you all and, and offer up um, an oli. Just it's an it's a um, it's a mele kuuna, which is an ancient oli, um, and it is it basically creates a space of equanimity so that those of us who are here have the opportunity to like be aware of the countless ancestors. Um, and because of Kyolu's conversation, I really feel the need that I have to do this. So. Kini ake kua, lehu ake kua, mano ake kua, puku i ake kua, nalani a kua, pali kapo puka keo, no kau pula pula. Kini ake kua, lehu ake kua, mano ake kua, puku i ake kua, lalani a kua, pali kapo puka keo, no kau pula pula. Um, that was just recognizing all of our ancestors. So if you can tell me, can you see my screen right now? No, I can't right now. Oh, that is so weird. Okay, hold on a second. Let me try that again. Can you see it now? Oh, it looks dark to me. I'm not sure what's going on. Live. I saw it for a second and then it disappeared. Oh, you did? Okay, so you And then now I can see your screen, but... um. Okay, so can you see my slides? Oh no, I know what I know what's going on. <laughs> Call them mine. Um, okay. O Louisa oi Wang Kong no oi hee. No ho ya David Pamaho McGregor no kalua nui. Ha nao o David Pamaho McGregor he pula pula. O Daniel Pamaho McGregor no kalua nui. No ho ya Valerie Branco no lau pa hoi hoi. Ha nao o Daviana Pomai kai he pula pula. Ha nao o Daviana Pomaikai no kai viula, no hoya din te borsho aligado no san narciso, hana o rosiana anolani he pula pula. O wai he ku kulaivi, o ahui manu kaha luu ku aina, o ma eli eli ku upu, o kaua po ai hale ku uvai. O la loa. So um, I just wanted to share and introduce to you myself and um, by introducing you to the spaces that my ancestors have touched and the waters from which we came. Um, I really want to thank the organizers of today's conference and especially Willow for inviting me um, to, to speak on this. And I want to give you a disclaimer. If you're here for coanoflagellates, I really apologize because I won't actually be talking about them today. Um, so this is your opportunity to jump off the Zoom. I won't be offended. Um, coanoflagellates still remain a major part of my lab, but I just won't be talking to them talking about them at this point in time. Um, so as, as Willow noted, I join you from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and I really wanted to give a land acknowledgement. There was such a beautiful land acknowledgement yesterday um, about where the um, kind of conference was being was being held at um, in the Bay Area, but I wanted to, to provide um, some context to my institution. So my institution, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, is a land-grant university also, and it's located on ceded lands. And I think we had conversation briefly that the land-grant system was established by the Morrell Act in 1862, which funded higher education directly for the seizure of 11 million acres of indigenous lands. And so while we can be appreciative of the value of extension services that land-grant universities pay and fostering relationships between universities and communities, we also have to recognize the inherent hypocrisy 
and the foundation of this system is being set in violent colonialism. I wanted to specifically talk about what are ceded lands. So the United States Congress has acknowledged that the 1893 overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii um, was illegal and a violation of international law. Uh, the U.S. Congress further conceded that the annexation of Ho the Hawaiian Islands five years later, which involved the ceding of 1.8 million acres of kingdom lands, was without the consent or compensation to the native Hawaiian people of Hawaii or their sovereign government. And I just want to say that it's really important for us to understand the longstanding history of, you know, the all that has brought us to be learning and residing on, on this land. And to recognize, of course, as Keolu kind of introduced to us, that colonialism is an ongoing process, including in science, and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. So I just wanted to um, kind of start off our talk with those acknowledgments and those introductions before I go on. So my, my basic interest, I am a microbiologist, and the questions that I love to answer all involve how do microbes through the production of their compounds through their in, you know through their relationships their symbiotic relationships impact our environment and in turn how does the environment impact the evolution and ecology of microbes my lab studies this on a very broad scale all the way from compounds to cells um, to what's going on on organ system levels up to larger host microbe interactions and all the way to the large scale of coastal estuaries this is going to be your, own, your only picture of quantiflagellates today, so I'm sorry because the majority of the rest of this talk, the remainder of the rest of this talk really, is going to focus on the role of microbes in coastal estuaries. Um, and I also have to say I'm in the Department of Oceanography, and so I am going to be talking, my quantitation is going to be a lot of oceanography-centered physical data. Uh, the motivation for this research that I'm going to share with you today is around climate change. And so we know that the global annual frequency of tropical cyclones, this here is averaged in 10 year blocks from the period of 1950 to 2000, uh, sorry, 2100, um, using historical simulations. We know that we're going to see an increase in frequency and we're going to see a change in the track density. And, that, and, and if you particularly look at this, and this is oriented so that the Pacific is in the center, um, where I'm from, people of the Pacific will be dealing with stronger and stronger hurricanes, not only rising seas. And so um, as a microbiologist and trying to, and recognizing that microbes play a foundational role um, and not only in you know the evolution of who we are as organisms on this planet, but also in the continued cycling of nutrients. Um, and how do we understand the studies of how bacterioplankton in these estuary assemblages, how they responded to physical forcing, such as storms. When we did a literature search, you can see that there are very few studies kind of asking the same question, number one. And number two, they're very much biased towards temperate regions. So we have very few areas where we can look at the impact of microbes and microbially driven cycling by geochemical cycling. You might even say ecosystem services in a tropical context. And so that's where these studies that I'm gonna talk about to, with you today. And um, this, all of the data that I'm showing you here is a partnership between my group and the indigenous stewards of the place that I'm going to be talking about, which is who are Pai Pai Oheia. So the, the location that I'm even talking about is an indigenous engineering built environment, engineered built environment. And I'm going to use the word loko ia, which means fish pond. So what can we learn from studying loko ia? I think that many of you who do study um, microbiome work will see some parallels, at least I do, between thinking about the watershed as the human body and um, the work that I'm going to share today. So the work that I do, I'm not going to share everything, but just so that you understand, we can utilize studying local EA as almost like a mesocosm. So we can use it as a baseline um, to, for uh, land use change to look at that. We can determine the effects of restoration, um, so attempts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We can understand the one-off impact of episodic events, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And we can also transform research into stewardship. Because of the nature of this, I don't always share this slide in scientific talks, but because, you know, I'm with relatives and with kin, I really wanted to share with you how Hawaiians innovated 
um, these amazing structures and how we um, embedded this knowledge in our mo'olelo or our stories and legends. And the first, the really the story of the first fish pond is Kamo'olelo Lehoula. So the first fish pond was built on the island of Maui in the district of Hana and actually is currently owned by Oprah Winfrey today. So if any of you have connections to Oprah Winfrey, please ask her to donate this, this land back to the community. Um, it was it was developed and engineered and innovated and invented by a man named Ku'ula. But and Ku'ula was later deified as a god. Um, by Hawaiians because he had this supernatural understanding of fish. And what I say is like, I would rather be deified than get a Nobel Prize because this guy was like the best fish ecologist, biologist, climatologist um, that, that we know of. And that's the level and status that Hawaiians like raised his skill level to. What's important is that he was the head fisherman during a time of famine. We don't know what was causing the famine, but we know that there was a problem with the food supply. And so through his careful observation, his scientific thinking, he realized that nutrients from the land would be draining from streams, were draining into the near shore coral reef and stimulating growth of phytoplankton. And he realized that if he built these walls atop the fringing coral reefs, he could constrain the biogeochemistry and increase um, productivity, primary productivity or photosynthesis. And so that's what he did. That's what this wall shows, is he built the first fish pond at the confluence of stream and ocean. But he didn't just build an enclosed pond, he built it with these sluice gates, or what we call makaha, to enable flux of nutrients, both from the ocean and, and from the streams, to mix with each other. What was really powerful was that this enabled cultivation of fish all year round. And um, estimates place that we had about 488 fish ponds at the time when Cook came in in 1778. And if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation of um, the average fish pond size being 18 acres, I'll save you the back of the envelope math and just say the amount of protein that we acquired from fish ponds alone was 2 million metric tons a year. That's not only talking about coral reef fish, that's not talking about ventures to the, to the far shore. So this was really... Um, what I like to say is that fish ponds were really an innovation of um, necessity. And that's something that I like to keep in mind when we think about studying these fish ponds now and not just re, um, rejuvenating them for um, food sovereignty for our local communities, but also that they can really teach us important lessons about the climate and what's changing now. So loko ia are the indicators then of watershed health because they sit at the base of the watershed. So you can just go sample at the fish pond and it can tell you about the health all along. Um, what we know is that when there are high nutrients and specifically nitrogen and phosphate, that results in the primary producers growing and they tend to be diatoms, which is bigger and that's better for food fish. When there's low nutrients, when nutrients are limited, the growth tends to be cyanobacteria. Now I'm, I'm drastically oversimplifying it, but just get the idea that high nutrients, diatoms, low nutrients, cyanobacteria. And what the other thing is the type of um, fish that they cultivated. They weren't cultivating predator fish or carnivores. They were cultivating primary consumers. And actually, the species that they cultivate are, are um, you know, you can really see our Trans-Pacific heritage because we were cultivating mullet and milkfish primarily, which is still today one of the primary cultivators you can see in the Pacific and in Asia. The shortened food web also was much more efficient in terms of energy transfer. And so you could really, um, you know, you can, as I said, you can either grow 10,000 um, mullet fish or you can grow 10 ahi tuna. So, you know, you can feed a lot more people by um, designing your aquaculture system in a very specific way. Um, and so the study site that I'm taking you to is an 800 year old fish pond called Heia Fish Pond, which is in, in um, the embayment of Kaneohe Bay on the windward side of Oahu. And so we're going to zoom into this red area. Oops, sorry. I'm going to go back a little bit. And I just wanted to show that these are the, the white circles on the uh, right hand side are study sites. And I thought there was an animation that was going to show from this, but that's all right. So the reason why I kind of think about this as a body is because what happens is we have different inputs that are kind of coming together in this um, fish pond. So you have marine sources, you have terrestrial sources of nutrients, also bacteria, also things coming in on particles, and they're mixing, right? And the biogeochemistry is altering or changing. and. Um, that is going to have a direct impact on the microbes. And because the microbes are the base of the food web, that is going to have an impact on the productivity of this fish pond. Okay, fish. 
<laughs> so um, what I'm going to tell you about now is the impact of physical forcing events. So when storms or floods or rain events come in, what that's going to do is that's going to alter the balance of whether or not we have more influence from marine sources or more influence from terrestrial sources. And so then, of course, the idea is the biogeochemistry will change, the microbes will change, and then, you know, some interaction of them to each other, right? So you can have the introduction of new species, but also the way that um, the geochemistry proceeds will affect and select for different kinds of, it will affect the community structure. So my methodology, I like to say, is INA-based, um, INA and, and, you know, INA-oriented INA and instrument-based. And INA is the Hawaiian word for land, but actually if you delve deeper, that's a very superficial translation. I really means that which feeds. And so we really think of the INA as that which has a reciprocal um, kind of sustenance for kanaka or man. Our baseline hypothesis is that the ancient Hawaiian uh, ecosystem, fish pond ecosystem, was high productivity, high biodiversity, and Im importantly, in, in, it included men. It included kanaka, men and women. It wasn't a pristine, untouched, wild place. But because of land use change, such as development, such as dredging, um, such as change in agriculture toward and redevelopment, um, our kind of past, near past ecosystem is low productivity, low biodiversity. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore it with biocultural restoration, utilizing information from our ancestors called Ike Kupuna. Um, Kiolu referred to the Hawaiian language newspapers, our archives. So we have um, some of this knowledge. And to that, we're also adding contemporary aquaculture knowledge to restore the fish pond. And then I'm bringing in and, you know, bringing to bear all these more contemporary tools um, like biogeochemistry, like physical, you know, oceanographic things and, and microbial sequencing. And so all of this together is the idea between behind how we can tell whether all of this biocultural restoration that's going on in this fish pond, that I'm going to show you whether or not it's working, how it's working, how it's transforming. So our baseline goals in these studies here is, I've, I've worked at this fish pond since 2014, since moving back home to Hawaii, um, is to one, detect baselines. Can we figure out if there's a core microbiome to a fish pond? And do we see seasonal fluctuations in the communities? Because even though it's Hawaii, we still have a weather pattern. It's wet, dry season, not four seasons. Can we infer trophic connectivity? So in other words, can we construct co-occurrence networks to ascertain the microbial food web? Oh, and I lied. There's one more picture of a quantoflagellate here. And we, in fact, um, one of the reasons why I started this work was to be able to identify new quantoflagellate species to bring and develop as model systems. And so we have identified additional quantoflagellate species. And we think that their life history, really we looking at the ecological um, kind of questions around life history transitions, um, particularly in quantum flagellates, but other microbial eukaryotes is extremely fascinating, but it's a black box. So this is another way to view the fish pond food web is we have nutrients, they turn into phytoplankton, they get eaten by all kinds of mysterious micro eukaryotes, including quantum flagellates. Those in turn get eaten by zooplankton and other small fish, and that turns into larger fish, which we eat. And the final um, major goal of our studies in the fish pond is to really kind of test and understand the pulse disturbance hypothesis in a background of not only global climate change, but also human, um, you know, kanaka empowered, community empowered biocultural restoration. So when we have these events, does that facilitate an alternative stable state shift? Or has the restoration been able to kind of like forwardly ameliorate um, any changes to um, the environment? So I just wanted to give you a big snapshot of the work that I've been doing. Um, we have been sampling, and I'm going to show you a picture of my, my lab team of who the we is. Um, this is our study site, as I said. We have freshwater input from the stream, and we have saltwater input from the ocean. We have a number of different sites across the pond. It's an 88-acre fish pond. And the, all of these crazy vertical lines is just to kind of show you the days that we've gone out sampling um, just in a snapshot of one year. And we're capturing uh, different tides, high and low tides. And we also happen to capture three hurricanes because it was hurricane season. And we um, are doing biogeochemical sampling co-registered with microbial sampling. And so we're beginning to tease out these multi-annual seasonal patterns in all of these things. 
Um, the we, of course, um, are my, my army of undergrads and my army of Kanaka graduate students, as well as our community partners. I particularly want to give a shout out to Kili Ikotubete, um, as well as Mari Gottling. So um, I, I am realizing that I'm like talking too slow and I need to talk faster. <laughs> so, oh, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Oh, you don't have okay. to be like super on time or anything like that. Okay. Just be all so I want to tell you guys, yeah. oh, thank you. I want to tell you guys a little bit about Tropical Storm Wally, which was, which brought really heavy rain to the island of Oahu. And actually, this is the first tropical storm that hit the island of Oahu in about 20 years. So you can see it started as a tropical depression. It um, started devolving. And that's another aspect that we're kind of learning now with um, a lot of these tropical storms is that they'll devolve and get disorganized, but they'll still dump a ton of rain. And so it, it's almost interesting because because the modern um, like atmospheric science people don't have a name for when these things devolve. So you can see that it devolved into this massive rain cloud. We, we now call them rain bombs um, kind of anecdotally. And maybe that's something that's going to kind of capture and catch in the literature, but we call them rain bombs because they're disorganized masses that used to be organized storms. But for whatever reason, when they get to Hawaii, um, they just bomb on certain really specific areas of the island. And that's actually happened twice in the past three years on the island of Kauai. And it actually cut off huge areas of the North Shore. Anyway, so this is what the rain bomb looked like um, uh, in Hei'ia, July 20th, 2014. Just to give you a kind of just fast look at the kind of data that we do. So we deploy instruments inside the fish pond that is able to capture in real time what's going on. So you can see I've outlined it in red, the storm, the precipitation, we got a bunch of rain in a really short period of time. The stream, you can see went from very baseline to big. So we had a flood of water that came in the stream. Now fresh water is cold. So the temperature dropped and then had to recover. Um, the salinity dropped all the way down to zero. So just so you know, fresh water is zero and salty ocean water is 35. And it actually took 19 days for it to recover. And then you can also see, if you look at the brown line, that's the, the second from the bottom, that the turbidity increased and it increased about 300%. So what we're looking at is we're looking at rain event that then caused a flash flood that brought in a whole bunch of sediment. And of course you can guarantee that there's gonna be microbes on that. Okay, so this is at one site, but we also take measurements at all of our sites and we can kind of replicate and see those same conditions in the fish pond and then look at both the two weeks before and the two weeks prior and we can look at recovery. Um, this is another way we can visualize our data. We can create kind of heat maps so we can get a more global um, picture of the, bio, uh, of the geographical distribution. So just looking at the temperature, like I said, you can see that the fish pond and in each of these blocks, I'm showing you the surface temperature as well as what's going on at the bottom. And the reason why I show that is because in estuaries, you have this saltwater wedge where you have um, salt water, um, salt water on the bottom and fresh water on the top. So you can see that you, you still have really good mixing of the fish pond. The, the salinity went down to zero, got really low. Um, the pH also dropped a lot. We think that's because of water coming in from the wetland that's kind of acidified. And we also see some really interesting other changes with the nutrients. Uh, you can see the turbidity or how, you know, whether or not you can see it. Um, mud came in and ammonia came in. Um, nit nitrite went down really low and a lot of silica came in. Okay, so it, it definitely increased these teragenous inputs. We know from our Pearson correlations um, that the environmental conditions definitely co-varied with our storm conditions. So we know that this is something that wasn't just a random change. When we look at what happened to the microbial community, here's where it gets really interesting. The bacterial plankton diversity um, increased during the storm. And we could actually discern a core microbiome and then different assemblages that came out. Um, I'm going through this because I want to get to, to something else, which is our community work. But in general, you should see that the beta proteobacteria um, definitely increased in the storm. What's interesting, and we're still teasing this apart, is that the microbial eukaryotes, this is 18S data, the diversity did not change during the storm. So we're really trying to figure out how is it possible that the bacteria changed so dramatically, but the microbial eukaryotes did not. We still see this core microbiome, but it just wasn't as significant. We could see a very faint storm picture, but when we kind of go through and we look at, okay, what really changed? What we saw was that the relative abundance of what changed was really the phytoplankton. And so what we see then is you have this 
influx of nutrients that then spurns diatom abundance and diatom growth. And so we have this boom and bust then of nutrients that could then facilitate um, better fish production. So this is what it looks like. What I'm showing you here is this um, multi-dimensional plot of like all of those microbial communities. And then um, we're also kind of labeled on top of that a biplot of how these parameters kind of correlate to and change with all of those biogeochemical parameters that I showed you. And so we can see that really the, the fish pond community was pretty tight and then the, the storm brought in all these new things so it got really diverse and then it kind of started to recover. But in the case of 18S you have this community that's really tight and it's just shifting in response to the nutrients. So it's a very different picture that we're still in the process of going through. Um, so it's definitely increasing the pathogenic species to the coastal estuaries, but we do see that certain aspects of these microbial communities are resilient, and it's definitely facilitating a shift in stable states for certain groups or large populations. Um, and we think that maybe some of being in the middle, where you have some facilitating stable shifts and some being resilient, is a hallmark of the biocultural restoration that's really going on. Okay, in the remaining time that I have, I want to talk about how I was really able to do this work in partnership with community. And I really need to give credit to um, the team of other people that I worked on on this project. Um, and this is called Kulanani, and it's a process for establishing equitable relationships with community. And the idea is, and first of all, I want to say, I do not view community as a monolith, nor academic research as a monolith. When you have to draw cartoons, you have to be reductionist. But it's the idea that one of the things that makes community-based research hard is that we as academic researchers have our own sets of needs, right? We need to get our grad students out. Our grad cycles are in three to five year periods. We need to publish papers. And then community interests have their own timeline. They're multi-generational. You know, they're doing this as a part-time job. Um, they're gonna be here when you're gone. And sometimes, and many times, we are part of those communities as well, and especially if we're indigenous peoples. So when they don't meet, it goes badly. When we can meet in the middle and when we can really take the time to establish sustained relationships, we believe this is where the good stuff happens, where we can really leverage and create beyond ourselves an increased vision, leverage more resources, co-create knowledge, and teach from each other and share our capacity um, and really create large, large-scale impact. And it really, um, kind of mirrors the idea that Willie Ermine had of you know creating that ethical space of engagement. I don't like using uh, indigenous language terms without defining them. So the first term kulana, and you can kind of say kulana if you like without me, refers to station or rank. It, first of all, you should know that Hawaiian, when it's translated, has many, many layers, literal and then metaphoric. So it's what's your rank, what's your position, but it's also how do you carry yourself? How do you stand? Do you stand tall or are you like bent over because you're embarrassed because you did something wrong? Um, Noi'i means to seek knowledge or information, to investigate basically, to do research. So when you put these two together, Noi'i becomes actually an adjective. So Kulana Noi'i basically means what are your research attitudes? What are your research positions? How do you carry yourself in your community when you do research? And what I'm about to share with you, I think was very much born in the Heia Ahupua, very much specific for this group. We have since been able to expand it because there is a lot of resonance with other communities. And even um, amongst our scientific collaborators, we found that these principles are quite useful. So um, it was developed um, in co I, we co-produced this with um, a nonprofit group, Kua Aina Ulu Awamo. We then also um, held a number of workshops with community stewards and researchers. We also pulled from the broader um, body of academic literature. And if you would like to find it, please, I'll, I'll share this this website as well. It's, it's really um, an, a, a lovely document that I'm really proud of to make. Um, what we found when we met with those researchers, when we looked at the past work of others, so I, I wanna say this is not new, it, this kind of a best hits that we then made very specific to um, Hawaii is we came up with eight kulana or eight stances or positions. And it's not a checklist. It's, it's actually best practices with guiding questions. And the reason why that's good is because 
because it's process based, it is then flexible enough for broad application. And the other thing that um, we like about it is that it considers not only community perspectives, it considers researcher perspectives. So we ask community and researchers to kind of see through um, one another's eyes as a as a way to hearken to um, um, Maggie's wonderful keynote from yesterday. Just wanted to check in with you that this is not a compliance standard or a checklist for receiving reciprocal you know, community partner relationships. It's a set of ideas, of values, of behaviors that when applied can build a more just and generative relationship. So I'm not gonna go through all of it. I'm going to basically just read the blue stuff, but the first is respect. The other thing I wanna say is a lot of these are super obvious, but then in practice, it can be quite difficult. So respect to us means the history, the people, and the place are respected through understanding, acknowledging, and honoring local culture, traditions, knowledge, and wisdom. And then you can see how we, we help people to get there by asking these different questions. Reciprocity, again, these are all themes that were brought up yesterday. The relationship of between researchers and communities is reciprocal rather than extractive. And again, you know, asking these questions. How are community members gonna be compensated? How will the budget be allocated among partners? How is everybody gonna be, you know, um, contributing? It's also important for us to think about what is, what is the individual self-awareness and capacity we each bring? And so that awareness of our positions, our intentionality, our value as an individual, but also recognizing we're, we're representing our, our lab, our department, our university, whether or not we ask for that, those mantles or not, often they're just layers of, that we carry with us. Um, and so that's pretty important. Communication is always, always <laughs> something that needs to be worked on. And so the goal is to pursue inclusive, transparent, and open communication throughout the research process. It's important to understand what the community looks like. There could be a diversity of practices, ages, origins, livelihoods. Sometimes there's internal conflict within the community and you're gonna have to navigate it. There's not gonna be one sage person, oftentimes not, sometimes there are, who you can go to to get, you know, to communicate. For us, it's important to maintain a long-term focus beyond just our grant cycle. So research projects should contribute positively to the effort to care for Malama, this vahi, this sacred place. Community engagement and co-review promote co-learning and co-development of methods, strategies, goals, and outcomes that are adaptable to local place, people, climate, re resources, and needs. And then this is one of the ones that like has really changed between the first version and second version of this document is this used to be called knowledge, ownership and access and out of recognition that those terms are at odds oftentimes with um, data in indigenous communities, worldviews, um, epistemologies and ontologies, we shifted this to knowledge stewardship. So as part of our kuleana, you'll see I'm using more Hawaiian words, in the document there's a link that you can go to, to that has a very comprehensive definition, part of our responsibility, but also burden. So kuleana means rights and responsibilities to place ancestors and descendants. Communities should have access to a, an ability to utilize the data because it's our relations. Our data are our relations. Communities have decision making power and determining how that information are shared. And there's a lot more questions that we really developed around this because we really wanted to build this out. And then accountability. When a project fails to meet these kulana, because you know it's gonna, that happens in every single research collaboration, how are we going to work together to identify problems and adjust the project accordingly? So I just wanted to show the group of researchers and community members that came together um, in helping us to pilot this study. This really only works in practice. This is literally at Heia Fish Pond, where we are giving our um, sweat equity to, you know, to the community, to the to the stewards as researchers. Before we come and collect data, we come and give um, our time. Um, we also um, worked with the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Hawaii to develop this and institutionalize this more. We had 70 participants from over 14 departments. This has become in, um, institutionalized within many of our grant requests for proposals here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and then more broadly um, uh, within C the Sea Grant Organization of NOAA. And um, we also have now made it a requirement to train many of our researchers who get funds through this way. And so this is actually a picture of our researchers who are funded, they are in community, we take them out and are like, this is how you do it. 
because we're just going to want to throw you in the in the pool. And so I just want to end with this. The impact of Kulana Noi'i is that since 2017, this number is now way bigger. We've hold, held probably now over 40 workshops. We, we held them throughout the pandemic, and we've trained over 600 people. Um, so with that, I apologize for going over, but I want to, there's so many people that I need to acknowledge, including you guys for sticking with me. So mahalo. Thank you so much, Rosie, for that. Um, this is really, really cool. I'm sorry for my introduction that, that implied you talk about Koanos. No, I, I think what you're doing is amazing and, and thinking about, um, uh, yeah, thinking about things from, from as I like the analogy to a microbiome, but these micro environments, I, I, I'd be really curious to see if you're going to do like RNA-seq or anything on the microbes in there to see if they're like after, after these storm surges and all of that. Um, there's one question, perhaps we can take one question. Um, Gent Stone has a question. Can you add your question to the Q&A, Gent? Because we can't, I don't know how we unmute you, so. Um, yeah, but do you have um, any plans to do that sort of RNA-seq? Yes, oh, yes, we, the, we definitely do. Um, I was gonna answer a question that Maggie had posted. Um, she asked yeah. if many kupuna have gotten interested or come to contribute to the work. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the When we had the held the community me meetings, um, the place that we work in, Heia, we are very lucky to have very strong and active kupuna. And they have really guided and led our work. And, and um, before we um, publish our work, we, we definitely always get it reviewed. Um, so we've been very inspired actually and are very you know by the work of, of Singh and other other present other presenters that you've had in the last two days and so we've we've definitely worked really hard to continue to engage our elders and kupuna oh, wonderful All right, we can. Um, wh what do you think, Leandro? Do you want to get started, or do you want to wait a bit? This is your, this is your land. Um, we can probably go ahead and get started since there's about the numbers like been pretty um, stable. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you want? Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Or? Uh, yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Shay, Leandro, Daly, and Ashia. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leandrew. I'm a third year PhD candidate from the Navajo Nation in the Chemistry and Chemical Biology graduate program here at UCSF. So first off, I wanted to thank the organizers, especially Willow, for organizing this symposium, but also inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm excited to discuss with our panelists today about how to integrate Indigenous and Native identity into research and activism. So before we begin with the questions, I'll start by uh, introducing our panelists. Um, <clears throat> first off is Dr. Rosie Aligado, who is an Associate Professor of Oceanography at the University of, University of Hawaii at Manoa. She received her PhD in Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford University and currently serves as Director of the Sea Grant Center of Excellence in Integrated Knowledge Systems. Her research is focused on how microbes shape the adaptive potential of their ecosystem across a broad range of biological and temporal skills. And working with the nonprofit Papeo Hea on the Hea, sorry if I butchered that, Hea Fish Pond, she's helped to develop an equitable partnership between the community and researchers. Next up, Dr. Matt Anderson is an assistant professor of microbiology and microbial infection and immunity at Ohio State University. He received his PhD from Stanford University and his research focuses on genetic determinants of clinically relevant path phenotypes in the major human fungal pathogen Candida albicans. He is also a board member and treasurer of the Native Biodata Consortium, the first biobank from indigenous people led by indigenous scientists. He has also been involved with a summer internship for Indigenous people in genomics, which seeks to indigenize uh, genomics research and train Native American, Alaska Native. Oh, sorry. The, which seeks to uh, indigenize genomics research and 
trained Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiians in genomic research. Up next, Dr. Kaolu Fox is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, affiliated with the Department of Anthropology, the Global Health Program, the Halakioglu Data Science Institute, the Climate Action Lab, and the Indigenous Features Lab. He received a PhD in genome sciences from the University of Washington, uh, Seattle. His work focuses on the connection between raw data as a resource and the emerging value of genomic health data from Indigenous communities. He serves as a board member for the Native Biodata Consortium and as a global chair for the Equity for Indigenous Research and Innovation Coordinating Hub. And last but not least is Dr. Andrea Gomez, an assistant professor of neurobiology at the University of California, Berkeley. She received her PhD in developmental genetics from NYU and conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Dr. Gomez started her lab at UC Berkeley in 2020, where her lab uses molecular biology, electrophysiology, and functional imaging to decode the intrusive cues that organize neural networks. So with that being said, uh, we can just jump right into the questions. So the first question is, some parts of scientific viewpoints are seen to be in conflict with the native worldview. Um, in essence, the creation myths versus uh, the big bang. Um, as scientists, how do you find a balance between your native viewpoints and the science you do? And when do you allow one to guide the other? How can one not alienate one's native or scientific communities? Andrea, I wanted to start with you because you recently just started your lab. So you're probably navigating a lot of these questions. And I guess you could say you always navigate these questions if you are um, kind of brought up with some of these, you know, mythologies or creation stars, stories. I mean, even as a child, I think you are able to grasp that the metaphorical, metaphorical nature um, about a lot of our, our creation stories. And in part because we, as children, um, we're trying to recognize patterns in our environment and innate relationships between these patterns. And so for me, it's never really been a, a conflict to, to blend um, these, uh, these kind of worldviews. And I think that if you're, however, but if you are kind of um, only given say the Western worldview, um, it may be difficult to kind of then derive some of these kind of uh, relationships between switching between metaphor and, and um, rational. Um, but so, so I guess maybe the, the long story short is for me, it never felt um, like a conflict, um, but I think it, it does really matter, that, you know, um, how we, how we utilize our, our language about kind of describing the, the relationships between these two, because as you, as you mentioned, it, it does uh, act to alienate. Um, whenever we create hierarchy or, or place value. Um, in terms of how to, um, I will, I mean, other, I don't have like an academic framework for it other than like, don't be a, a jerk or don't be, you know, kind of di dismissive in general. I think that there's kind of like this dismissiveness um, aspect about Western science um, from which I don't, I, I guess maybe stems from them creating hierarchies and their, in their societies as they do, but I kind of, I, I, feel, I really don't really understand how, how to, but um, what view it is as a necessity. Thank you. Yeah, I believe that, you know, our, our presence here is, is sort of uh, highlights that, that we are those innovators towards finding how, how not to alienate one or the other. Um, Matthew, would you like to answer next? So is it the same general question? Something that I think a lot of folks that have participated today and yesterday do is include community as much as possible into the into the work that's kind of going on, so that the work that's being done isn't being only perceived in a framework that kind of conforms to academic institutions, right? This industrialized worldview of how science is supposed to be done or what the interpretations can be. Um, and I think really thinking about ways to be active and including more perspectives and acknowledging the contributions of those perspectives in the process is going to be really important, no matter where your work takes you. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Kaylee, would you like to add more insights to this question? 
Sure. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> recently I was just thinking about the way, you know, we, we narrative built, we tell stories. Nobody can tell stories the way we do, right? Think about all of your, your tutu, your, your grandmother, your grandfather, all of the kupuna, the elders in our communities. And that's exactly what happens with the way we interpret data. So maybe, I mean, my experience is mostly with humans um, and genome sequence data from humans. And you'll have the narrativization and interpretation of something that appears as empirical, right? And this is what like Andrea and Matt are talking about this hierarchical um, relationship. And it's highly problematic because the people telling the stories often discredit certain things that our communities do, or they blame our current health conditions and health disparities on innateness, saying that it's part of our genome, when in reality, it's a direct aftermath or hangover or residue of colonialism and separating indigenous people from our hunting rights, our fishing rights. And so many of the narratives they build, uh, like the thrifty gene theory, for example, that's one that we were happy to dismantle by taking a reverse genetics approach and using base editing to create isogenic cell lines and say, you said this mutation does X, Y, and Z based on a p-value, and you only took it to the correlative level. We now have causative evidence that <clears throat> not only is your science inaccurate, but the narrative you've built is racist. And I think that it's our responsibility in the next generation of scientists, many of the people that are here, to continue to build our own stories. And then lastly, because I know I'm talking too much, this directly applies to the biggest question uh, of our time, which is climate resilience and the climate crisis. And there's an amazing piece by Julian Aguan that was in the Atlantic, and it is all about telling stories and their importance. And I'm just going to put it in the chat, and I encourage everyone to read it. It's outstanding. It made me cry. Yeah. Thank you, Kielu. Um, Rosie, would you like to, to finish out this question for us? Yeah, um, so in when we study wetlands and, and environments, there's this term called hysteresis, which is that it's another word for it is autocorrelation, right? That the results that you have today are dependent upon the conditions prior to. Um, and I think in thinking of your question, we all have to be cognizant of some of our own implicit uh, internalized colonialism, right? So I. I went, through, for example, you know, when we just call it science, why aren't we calling it Western science, right? So we're normalizing Western epistemologies and ontologies and viewpoints. So I think the question we should maybe repose it as is some parts of Western science are in conflict with a native worldview. Because I would say, you know, first of all, right, science develops and its approaches and viewpoints and methodologies developed in the context of the cultures um, in which they are, you know, in which they evolve. And so I would say like Hawaiian science is not in conflict with Hawaiian worldviews. But, you know, when we look at the history of how Western science and Western religion or Western culture have evolved, yeah, I can see there's conflict. I mean, you know, let's imprison Galileo. Let's believe there's a flat earth, right? Like that is something where you can totally put it in a bubble, the Western conflict with Western religious thought but it should not be conflated and applied to and generalized onto how native people um, reconcile and interpret their scientific knowledge in their own worldviews. And I also think that there's a lot lost in translation because so many indigenous cultures and native cultures are oral. The orality of our knowledge, um, number one, has often come with it and it has to do with the fact that Western culture is centered in the written word, that we really like things set in stone, literally, that were not changeable. And because many of our cultures are oral, there is a hierarchy of knowledge of thinking that oral cultures are not as good as written. You know, um, you know we're, we're called prehistoric cultures because we don't have history, but we do have history in our oral practices and our oral traditions. And so I think that so much gets lost in this so it's multi-layered right so it's number one this question of orality and hierarchy of knowledge that just kind of sets the stage and then number two the translation of what gets lost in translation and we have to remember that 
who translates these knowledges and these informations from their original from their original state into English language oftentimes so much is lost and I think we then apply that lens of what Western thinking was in Western history onto that native knowledge and then of course we come up with some some skewed filter view you know it's like you take the picture and then you apply the Instagram filter and now it looks crazy and alien but it's because the Instagram filter was Western knowledge so um that's a figure i'm gonna make that but anyhow that's that's my thinking around that wow i love that you just came up with an idea of a figure right off the spot <laughs> but um thank you so much for highlighting that dichotomy between world points and uh, native points native viewpoints and scientific viewpoints but moving on to our next question um relationality is an important concept to many native cultures as we sort of learned throughout a lot of the talks in the last two days especially the relationships that we have with our environments so how does the concept and the idea of relationality um, influence the way that you view and conduct science? And Rosie, I actually wanted to start with you because a lot of your research is focused on the relationship between uh, bacteria and their ecosystems. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, in terms of like thinking about how the idea of relationality influences my view, I want to be super clear that I'm still a learner, you know, in terms of my native practices. You know, when people, I practice science from a West, you know, like I've been trained in the Western Academy. Um, and then, and actually most of the time that I was on the continent learning, I just did Western science with Western questions and then moving home and interacting with the human components of my Kanaka community opened me up to realizing and, and required me to reconnect in that way. And so um, the idea of relationality as a microbiologist and as an evolutionary biologist actually fits very well. It's very aligning, you know, like we're all, you know, there's a, there's a, we're all connected. We're all related. You know, we have a least common ancestor, which was a microbe. Um, you know, microbes created the environment into which all life then evolved. So, you know, the work that I do now um, squares away very perfectly, I would say. I, and, and, and there isn't any conflict. And, and the way that I'm trying, I mean, I guess, I suppose what I would say is, how does it actualize into the way that I conduct science? Um, I do utilize um, archival knowledge as well as practitioner information to inform a lot sometimes um, the hypotheses that I'm building because I'm working in historical built environments and I don't know, I'm not an expert. And so I do consult with the kupuna, with the aunties to ask, what did it look like before? And then we construct together, like, why do you think it was different? So um, Kyolu and I were having a side conversation about ancestor guided hypothesis building. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I guess that's how I, that's how I am, have been relating to it. But I want to say that this is something that's new for me. I've only really done this in the last eight years. Um, it's not something that I did prior to. And, and I think what that means is we can all come to, if it's something, if we want to incorporate that, this relationality into our science, we can pick that up at any time. It's not like, oh my God, I've only gone to UCSF, MIT, and Berkeley, and I, there's no hope for me. I, I did, and I feel like there's hope for me. So, you know, um, all of us are in our own identity journey and pathway. And like I said, you can you can pick it up anytime. Well, could, could I add, we have back-to-back -back Kanaka EK bombs, no, I'm teasing, but I appreciate, I really appreciate that. Also, I should say like, you can come you you kind of give a part of yourself away and your intuition and uh, being trained in a lot of these institutions but when i get to see someone like ozi or matt really taking care of business it gives you the courage and let allows you to answer and approach new questions that are actually prioritized by our communities so i would say too when we think about relationality and human genetics it's when we say Mauna Kea is my ancestor. It's my kupuna. Here's what we mean. Let me translate it for you, Western scientists. It's that geography shapes our genomes. We are a reflection of the geography. We are a reflection of our diaspora. And so when 
we say that we mean it and it's based in empiricism it's based in our kumulipo and our understanding of biological complexity over time just because you don't know our canon doesn't mean we do know your canon because we did go to UW, stanford mit etc so so i think there's a, a huge problem with that when we're talking about what that relational idea high elevation also shapes the genome so does uh when you bury tons of nuclear waste on Navajo Nation. So does when you test 193 nuclear bombs from 1966 to 1996 in French Polynesia, that affects the reef, that affects our susceptibility to leukemia. And that's the relationality. And so maybe we have to say it in different ways that uh, the, the health of the Aina is the, the health of the people and the health of the people is the health of the Aina as Kalka Emmett Aluli always says. And it's, I think that'll be more and more helpful as we, you know, beat that drum in the future. Yeah, and I definitely feel like what Rosie was saying about actualization versus um, uh, influence, I think that's, that's a really important component that you're bringing up. Um, Andrea, would you like to go next? Yeah, I really appreciate it, Rosie, you saying that you're, you know, you're a learner um, in these practices because um, I think the, the intuition that I have when I'm thinking about my questions is synthesized with, you know, the stories and like the values that I have from, from my, my, my culture. Um, I, I'm not only, I'm not, I'm only now being able to kind of articulate it thanks to, you know, kind of STS um, practices and, and learning about like, how, you know, these, these terminologies where it's like all my questions in science, I are indigenous. And even though the, um, I can frame it, you know, as Kim Liu said, we have the canon to be able to, to articulate it in, in their language as well. Um, the, the creativity is, um, is, is pre-language for me. That's, that's you know, the, the ideas that are coming together, they're not made with words, they're made with kind of this, this idea and the relationship that I'm building to myself. Of course, my ideas are not, I, I, you know, I really admire like, ecologists, like I feel like my my studies are like focused like inward, like infinitely fractal, but the, um, the questions and the relationships themselves, um, I think, um, yeah, are pre-verbal. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Matthew, would you like to go next? And I, just like uh, as a heads up, I actually came up with this question after I heard this interview that you did um, about the Native Biodata Consortium, and you're talking about the relationship that we have with the microbes in our stomach. I thought that was a really cool idea. It's it's something that's kind of come from a lot of these conversations. So I think you're hearing that over and over, right? Things like this, the opportunity to, to converse with other folks that are looking at things a little bit differently than the way you've been trained and be able to start to pull yourself away from that training that you got a little bit is really powerful. And I, I know that we're probably going to talk to this a little bit later um, about what being able to kind of dictate the narrative uh, allows or doesn't allow. And so in thinking about some of the, the microbiology that, that our group does, you see this and it's, it's just starting to gain a lot more traction over the last like 10 years, this idea that human health is dictated by microbes at all levels. And the way that we act and interact with the environment dictates the microbes that we associate with, right? And so this relationality, this dependency cuts both ways. And we don't, as humans within the continental or non-continental United States, we don't respect other organisms enough to let that sink in. And everybody gets really upset that biodiversity globally is being lost, but here we are in the practices that are promoted by industrialized nations continuing to move forward in ways that are just destroying everything, including the organisms that we can't see that have been interacting with us for millennium, right? And so we need to be thinking intentionally, and this is particularly relevant for those of us to use microbes in our work, about how we're being respectful and are honoring the microbes that we work with. Are we growing things that serve no purpose? Are we working with things that are gonna be wasteful in any way, shape or form? And how can we 
interact with the microbes in a way that best kind of honors the sacrifice that different components of our world give to us so that we can understand and try and help ourselves and then hopefully be able to also provide that benefit outward, right? Um, and so this is why, you know, we need to find alternative models for infection. So we're not using like animals to feel pain and feel hurt and like are causing harm in certain ways that other models maybe be able to avoid. So if you can use an insect model, you're still requiring sacrifice from the organisms, but you're not requiring the pain. You're not requiring the distress, right? So how can we be better relations, not just to the things that we can't see, but the things that we can see that we're all trying to build outwards in a way that, that just honors each other. So hopefully that answers it. I would, sorry, I know you have another question. I just kind of want to respond because I think that's really important. So I do animal research. I do work on, on mice and it's a big challenge like every day to, to come in and try to understand whether or not the questions that we are, you know, we're interested in or as asking are, are worth to what we're, we're doing to these animals. Like, is, is there any type of reciprocation and try to find that. And I admit that it's, it's I, I struggle with it every single day. Um, and, you know, it, they don't know, but my, I brought my mother in to spread cornmeal in, in our animal house. Um, but it's, it's really challenging to, to understand what the relationship is to our global mental health crisis, the incidence of mental health in indigenous communities and our communities and ourselves, um, and trying to figure out solutions um, for, for, for this. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think the, the climate issue is probably the main source of the um, majority of our mental issues. But nonetheless, the neurodegeneration, for an example, um, we, we do need some, we do need some answers. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, the ultimate logic and sorry for um, taking over. I just oh, wanted no, to bring no, that up. No worries. Thank you so much for adding that final point. Um, unfortunately, we have to move on to the next question, but so in science, the pursuit of knowledge trumps everything. And occasionally scientists want to use data from native communities, build on or conduct studies for on sovereign land. So as scientists, how can we balance the need for sovereign, sovereignty with the pursuit of knowledge? And Keolu, I wanted to start with you because a lot of your work as Matt and uh, Willow have pointed out advocates for data sovereignty amongst indigenous populations. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, what, what myself, Matt, Crystal, Rosie, uh, everyone here, uh, Guthrie, um, has been searching for is creating alternative structures that empower our communities. And what I've settled on over the last few years is really understanding what this vertical integration of technologies looks like. If you're creating a relationship and it's an open data relationship, then why does that exist? Maybe that's under the false pretense of this having some sort of altruistic benefit for all, but that's usually pretty problematic because it means that it's the who's benefit. Does it benefit everyone equally? No, of course not, you know. Uh, so really, really imagining what it looks like when our questions are prioritized and our community's health, the, the metrics that we want to achieve, when, when can we achieve that? Is it going to work within this given system or do we have to create independent systems that are disruptive? And when can we actually work together? Because that's also necessary. Um, but 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 we need to be in positions of control ultimately. And if data is power, which it is, is the number one resource. I'll say it ten times a day. You know, uh, we need to be in control of our data. And what does it look like when NBDC gets our first satellite? How is that going to change things? What right? Like that's how big we need to think. What is right that that is what I hope the next generation of scientists from our communities is thinking about. And we are achieving these things and sometimes you have to look hard in the mirror and say is the potential funding body that's giving me money going to allow us to build the things we want to build or is it going to be within the context of their framework. And we need to think about that deeply and i'll just leave it at that. Thank you, and I, I feel like a lot of your work highlights the the, the purpose of this panel um, and, and some of the questions that we brought together. 
Um, Rosie, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, just to kind of pick up pick up the ball on on the idea of the use of I. <laughs> this is something that I you would think would be conversations that are actively happening at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, but it's not actually. And that's one reason why um, I've been so desperately trying to get Kyolu to come home is because we need to, we really need to disrupt um, a lot of these seated values because we are so much embedded, not only in um, indigenous Hawaiian spaces, but like indigenous, the indigenous Pacific as a whole. Um, and I think there doesn't have to be a conflict between open act, I'm a little off of if we're in the open access question of data sovereignty or not. I because I think that so so in kind of conversations around my university around this, there is very much this scarcity scared mentality. And, and that's actually why I look to, you know, a lot of the, you know, the Native Nation institutes and the Native um, consortiums around data, um, indigenous data sovereignty with so much with hope, because I think that we can have our own solutions um, to these, right? So, so there are indigenous built data management systems. So for example, there is a database system um, called Merkutu, which was developed in um, by aboriginals in Australia. And it, it adds additional layers to the data access. So like it says, you know, it, it can, you can add additional things like, oh, what gender are you? Because sometimes knowledge is gendered. Um, how, are you familiar with this protocol? Because sometimes access to knowledge, you know, requires you to be a practitioner of a certain level. Or are you from this place? Because sometimes this knowledge, say about where fishing locations are, fisheries data, should really only stay in that place because otherwise it could open up spots to poaching, right, and overfishing. And so um, I think, I think there's a question of how open is open, right? Like it's open to the people who need to know and then it's not open to the people who don't need to know. And so maybe we also have to think, why is it that we feel like we need to know? Why is it that we feel like we have the right to to be in, in, in those spaces? And and it's a hard thing because, you know, when we're federally funded as tax, you know, by taxpayer money, right? I agree taxpayers should, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would like to be able to download articles on colon cancer in case, you know, people in my family have colon cancer. But I think we have to have nuance around that conversation. There's a big difference between I get access to the raw data for me to do data mining and I want to, you know, learn more. And so I think we have to have the nuance around that. Could I add one tiny thing to, to what Rosie said too, because she's, th th this is an important point and a distinction. It's like how many of the computational languages that we use to parse data are actually designed by indigenous people. There's one and we all use it and you just didn't know. And it's called R and it was, it's by a Maori man by the name of Ross Ihaka. Mm -hmm. And that is why just like data structure for data structure, that language is so different than Python and so different than these other languages. And I just want you guys to think deeply about what that means and what our data future could be if we just begin to think about organizing data like that, <clears throat> so. Thank you, I didn't know that R was created by an indigenous person. Um, Matthew, would you like to go next? Sure. So now my allegiance to R is just amplified by Kaolu. Um, that's fine. Folks in my lab are still using Python and I'm just gonna keep hammering at them. So I think there's a lot of stuff going on right now to really talk about what Rosie and Kalu um, have gone to so far, this idea of accessibility. And so this is initiatives like the biocultural labels that were mentioned already to be able to give context to different either data or materials provided by different indigenous communities globally. And that, that can be used as a way to guide what information is provided to who um, and whether or not those people can even see that information to be able to try and get access to it, right? So it contextualizes information. And I think the, the initiative, and I think most of this is being uh, at least instigated by Maui Hudson over at the University of Wakato. I mean, this is baby, it's, it's happening. As far as like thinking about this idea of, of the pursuit for knowledge, 
Um, I mean, this is putting the opportunity for indigenous people to determine their own future. I mean, this is things like indigenous futures. This is like all the work that's currently happening, right? This is stuff that we talked about. I talked a little bit about yesterday with MBDC. It's, it's building infrastructure so that indigenous folks can figure out what's important and do it. So that that way it's not being dictated by some um, administrator or a group of academic scientists sitting in an office building in Washington, DC. It just doesn't make sense. So find ways for indigenous science to be done by indigenous people based on indigenous premises and get it funded. And right now that can be done. There are funders that are out there that want this to happen and they're willing to give you money if you show them that you can do it in a way that's gonna produce, that's gonna produce for the people you're serving. Thank you. The, your response reminds me a lot of this um, saying that I heard from a, an elder that indigenous futurism is the present because we live in a post-colonial society. Um, but Andrea, would you like to finish out, finish us out for this uh, question? Sure, I mean, the way I relate to, to kind of some of this um, extraction process is the, um, in, in, so I'm, we're, I'm in the psychedelic science world and a lot of, um, there's this rabid thirst for um, ceremonial knowledge. Um, in a lot of these, um, I guess, training spaces for how, how do we, you know, how do we train psych Western psychedelic guides um, to, to, you know, usher the, the person through the psychedelic experience. And they are rabid for, for, for these, 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 yeah, the ceremony, the sacred knowledge. Um, and it, it's, it's, I find it quite confusing to, to be able to navigate in this world because I'm indigenous. And so by virtue of me being indigenous, they like just ask me, like I know, like the practices of like, you know, hundreds of tribes, individual ceremonial practices. Um, it's, yeah, I think, and I think kind of to what Matthew's point is that the, the, the communities um, themselves need to be participating if they consent. Um, that's, that's like kind of my, uh, yeah, my perspective on, yeah, how do we balance the, this, like, need for, um, for knowledge and, and sovereignty. Thank you. Um, the next, the question is, um, is the representation and inclusion of Native people in Western science enough? How do we become stakeholders to Western scientific entities that want to conduct research in our communities and on our land? So Matt, I wanted to start with you because your involvement with the Native Biodata Consortium seeks to build tribal capacity in STEM. Sure, so this kind of gets at what Rosie was already talking about is the context for where the science is being done, right? Are there enough Native people working within academic and federal institutions dictating what science gets done and how it gets done? No, are there plenty of Native people doing science? Absolutely but the way that that's valued looks different, right? So there's a couple of different ways that this can kind of look moving forward. One is, again, with capacity building, allowing indigenous people to drive the science forward in a way that they see, right? The second part is infiltrating the system, which I think is what all, all of us here have been doing, right? finding ways to embed ourselves in the frameworks that have the power right now, and then push, pull, and slowly detonate from inside the way that these systems work to be able to shove the money into places where it's gonna change the way that things are run. Um, my PI in grad school was a 50 year old white dude that was incredibly insightful. And he said the biggest advantage for, or the, the most compelling reason I've heard for why science needs to diversify is because if it doesn't, everyone's gonna work on prostate cancer because 50 year old white dudes care about prostate cancer. So we need non 50 year old white males in academics so that they can change the way that federal monies get distributed to address problems that are of importance. And that, that's gonna to have to happen internally and it's gonna to to have to happen externally. And both of those roles are really important. Which way you decide to go with it is really up to you, but together, I think those things can change uh, what science is valued 
how this science is done and the applications and the importance within indigenous communities. Thank you. And I think that's an important component as to why this symposium is important because we probably allowing us to gather in a full circle allows us to dictate what kind of questions that we should be asking as we move into the future. Um, Kaolu, would you like to go next? No, I, I really just kind of completely agree with what Matt said and all of the organizations that we've kind of built in our super collective of people in this space. I'm hoping that we are just a magnet for the next generation of people that the next 100 years, we, our generation of scientists from our communities looks like, you know, uh, just a prototype you know, just something that is the, the I don't, you know, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like we, we believe that there's going to be a complete advancement in all of these trajectories, whether it's technology development, community engagement, the people who are involved, uh, the way we interface with new forms of data, like what types of new data sets. Rosie said something like, I don't remember, I think it was earlier this year, but it was just about using and connecting the new paper archive to a lot of the way we understand seasonal oscillations in, in Hawaii and how that's new data sets. Like, what are people going to think of? And um, that's just really exciting to me. And hopefully we build more uh, of these kind of satellite like locations that are working on these projects. I mean, nothing would mean more to me than building a lot of this infrastructure in Hawaii. So keep your eyes peeled. Thank you. And it sounds like we just really need a, an indigenous renaissance to, to happen. Not to say that we're not in one, but Andrea, would you like to, to, to go next? So how, so how do we become stakeholders? Is that where we're at? Um, I think that, um, yeah, the, just the kind of the communities. I, I think for, for, for me, you know, the first other native um, scientist, neuroscientist that I met is actually in this room, it's Lena <laughs> King. And, and so just having like the, you know, the, the small community already, even though it's, you know, N of two for right now, um, it, it's kind of so important. I think uh, for some of us who have kind of gone on these like disciplines that like maybe for, for me, if I find it really hard to kind of translate some of these um, like kind of our, my cultural things into some of the, the neuroscience-y things that I'm doing um, that uh, even though I feel it, I, I'm an, like my science is indigenous neuroscience. Um, I've just been kind of like, by myself thinking of these things. And so in terms of like uh, interacting or um, how to benefit, I, I would say that I'm still learning. Um, I kind of felt like kind of like a, a, an indigenous like loner nerd <laughs> um, up until recently, whenever uh, my network of indigenous scientists got bigger. Thank you. Uh, Rosie, would you like to finish this out with this question? I mean, I just think that the previous contribute like panelists have have just so comprehensively addressed that. I just want to uplift and amplify, and you know everything that they said. I mean, Matt, yes, like the infiltrating and detonating is definitely a key because we have to be in those we have to be in those institutions, in those scientific institutions, in order to turn the lens back and recast and re-highlight um, the issues that are important to us um, and to recenter. I mean, so that's what it is a lot of. It's it's that idea of decentering, right? And dragging the dragging the margins into the center um, is is really, really, I think, what it's what's going to be required. Um, and then kind of just thinking about like how do we become stakeholders to entities that want to conduct research in our communities. What I want to just flip that is say, I, I don't want to be a stakeholder to someone doing research. I want to be, you know, like no research without us. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, you have to include us in very active ways. And so that's why I'm such a huge 
um, fan of, of sing genomics because we have to we have to be able to be in those spaces. We have to be lockstep. We can't be like the beneficiaries, although it's great to be a beneficiary, we should be the beneficiaries. We can't be just the beneficiaries, right? Um, yeah, so to totally echoing that. And, and because when we are that, then we provide further mechanisms and additional mechanisms for people to say, it's not okay to do things. It's not okay for you to like take this kind of data um, because data are our relations, right? So, I mean, I think we've all agreed that our land is our relation, that mountain is our relation. It's not just, I think it's, a, I think it's easier for Western scientists, a Western lens to see the concept of my blood, my hair, my materials that derive from me, but it's a little bit harder for a Western point of view, but much easier for native and indigenous people to say that that river, that river is my relation, right? So the data that comes out of that river, you know, it's not just phytoplankton information because that phytoplankton information tells me how the fish are and that fish eventually feeds me. So I think when we are on the front lines are the people who are thinking of the questions and doing the work. That's that's what it needs to be. I think it. So I guess what I'm saying is we have to be more than stakeholders. We've got to be like the front lines of the people driving the research. Thank you. That was like I, so. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, can I jump in just really quickly? I think something that we we often don't stop and sit back and appreciate kind of well enough is how things have shifted over just the last 10, 15 years. So if we look at the native geneticists that came before, like folks like Rosie and myself, I mean, it was there's three that I can name. Dr. Dukapu, Dr. Pudri, who's here with us, and Dr. Gachupin, right? Those three. And then there was this flood of folks. We had Kealu, we got Katrina Claw, we got Nanaba Garrison. I mean, we got these people, there are multiple students coming out of the Gen X department right now at Stanford, right? We're in a time of change right now where we can do this. We can change the way that things are happening. And so while we're sitting here talking about things that should change, I think it's important to realize the amount of power that's building right now that we can use to collectively change things as they sit currently. Thank you for the insight, Matt. I think that's the perfect segue into our next question, um, which is sort of built on this idea of building community, but how would you encourage others interested in either incorporating their native identity or using their science to benefit native communities? Uh, let's start with Andrea. I guess one way that I, I do that um, in kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis is um, kind of the, the rules that we have in my lab for animal use. Um, so everybody um, knows how my viewpoint is on, on, on the use of animal research. Um, it's, a, it's actually in our handbook. Um, so, I mean, I guess in a way, like it's not quite like a, um, a educating experience, but like I'm allowing to kind of have them have a relationship to like understanding how I'm, I'm, my viewpoint is um, and how kind of those, those value systems are made. Now regarding how do I encourage interest uh, others um, to incorporate their native identity. I mean, I guess that would be an example of how I, how I do it. Um, um, but how to use science to benefit native communities. Um, I think, um, I'll, I mean, I think I'll just kind of be frank. Like I think some of the, the, the developments in um, say psychedelic research and getting IP, um, intellectual property for, for some of our, even our, our traditions um, may be something to, to discuss. I know a lot of, in, in, I know that this is a controversial thing to say. Um, a lot of indigenous people think it's um, sacrilegious to say something, to kind of commodify something like that. But I also feel like this knowledge is being extracted anyway. And I, I'm just trying to figure out how to bring resources back to our communities. I mean, so, sometimes we just need a dollar. <laughs> And just trying to figure out how to, you know, bring resources back into the community, um, leveraging this system that we're in, um, and at the same time trying to balance it with 
knowing that you're engaging in colonizing behavior. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's a challenge, but I, yeah, that's kind of my disconnected thoughts. Definitely a challenge and something that as a PhD candidate, I've been sort of thinking about a lot um, recently. Matt, would you like to answer next? Sure. Um, I think Judy did a good job of kind of demonstrating where their experiences took them into science, right? And that intersectionality of kind of what have you experienced, what have you seen growing up? I mean, that can come with you in a science. There's no reason to try and disconnect those things because I think they they inform each other, right? And the passion and the interest in pursuing those things is stronger when you're coming at it from a, a, an aspect of, of importance that exists kind of within your upbringing or within your worldview. So I would say, be mindful of the things that you've experienced, be mindful of the things that have impacted you through life or impact your community and take those with you. Pursue those things. Thank you, Matt. I think it's important to always maintain a piece of ourselves as we move forward. Kaylu, would you like to go next? Yeah, just to piggyback on the conversation around the intellectual property, this is going to be um, quite the Herculean effort from a lot of our communities. I mean, go and search anything on Google patent and you'll see the largest patent holder will always be the, you know, regents of the University of California, which many of our part us participate in the largest school system in the United States of America. It is really hard to educate young scientists and our community members on what those relationships look like. Sometimes you just got to cut out the middleman, find opportunities to create intellectual property royalties and other things using what we're really excited about benefit sharing mechanisms, whether they're long term or, or short term and how they can actually be used to buy back land, land that shaped our genomes in the first place, land that under the custodianship and guardianship of indigenous people will produce more oxygen and less, you know, offset carbon. And I think there's a lot to that. Um, Matt and I were working on a, like a paper recently, and we were thinking about this in the context of microbiome research, which is extremely sketchy and uncomfortable. And it was really hard to write about it. And I think we settled on the fact that we need to have like a indigenous ventures clearinghouse to help scientists think about IP to pair them with lawyers that we trust. This will be the next development or arm of expertise that we're going to need in the future because we can't just play defense all the time. You know, we have to get in position to buy our land back. It's not just a saying. Um, and uh, I think we're doing that. So also, I'm going to be late for teaching. I have nine minutes to get to the other side of campus. And uh, I really apologize for leaving, but it's just been lovely connecting with everyone. Genuinely, the highlight of my month. So I yep, love you all. Thank you so much for being with us, Kayla. Good luck with your uh, class. Um, Rosie, would you like to finish us out with this question? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things that is amazing about the University of Hawaii is that we do have um, a lot of native undergraduates, right? And many of them do want to go into graduate school and actually see their path to graduate school as being for their native communities. Um, and then of course they get into graduate school and it's like, that's not what I thought it was gonna be like. Um, and so I think a lot of what, where I see where we can improve on is to create safe space for a lot of our, you know, and, and Willow brought it up before, right? For, for them to be able to do that. And so, um, for me, I think my students and just people in general seeing, okay, we've co-developed this process called Kulana Nui'i. You can use this and by using this, you can integrate your native identity in your work because we're saying if you're going to work with communities and you're doing it for communities, you can do this in an ethical way. And so something that we've kind of developed in, um, in my lab is a policy of incorporating whatever at whatever level you feel comfortable 
you write in your identity into the methods section of your papers, meaning we write a section on actually not just methods, we call it what is our research methodology? What is our indigenous research methodology? And so for some people, it, it can it can it, you know it can just be a paragraph that says you know I incorporate my lived experiences into the approach of this and I decided to consult these elders or it could even be I have students in my lab who when they take samples you know they incorporate ceremony and protocol before they before they take something from 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 the earth or from from a body of water you know and I say right into that or they have even they've even felt that it was really important because of the sacred space where we were asked by the community to go into, that we only brought other indigenous people into that space and to explain and put that in there. And, you know, it's just one section of your methods section, but it then gets entered into this now legitimized written body of literature, right? And so it's our little way of kind of disrupting and infiltrating into that. And so yeah, I think it's two questions, right? One is how do we incorporate your, your identity into science so that it's heard, right? So that's kind of one way. And then how do you then use that to the benefit of your community? And I see a lot of my students kind of selecting their projects based on what they hope will be to the best benefit of their community. And it kind of goes off of what Matt was saying is like, really encouraging our students to to identify what are the problems that they see as being important you know why are our grandparents you know having these kinds of diseases instead of prostate cancer and following that you know i really love um judy's talk about that and it really reminded me of um of the way that so i went to a native hawaiian high school and that is actually the that is the methodology that we applied for designing science fair projects. It wasn't like, oh, you know, let's go measure, you know, paint or, you know, paint temperatures on a hot day. It was, we started off with the first day of science fair project was, what are the problems you see in your community? Okay, let's go, let's go make a science fair project about that. And I think that sensibility um, is great. And it's something that we can encourage, not only as where we are as graduate students, not only as undergrads, but yeah, I mean, that was something that we cultivated as, as high school students was to say, your, what you see in the community as problems are valid and there's a science approach to solve it. And I think that is something really powerful. Thank you. That is, that is a really powerful praxis and approach to incorporating these, intersecting these, and similar to how Andrea is doing this with um, her animal protocols in her lab. Um, unfortunately, this brings us to the end of this panel. So I just wanted to open up the mic uh, to the panelists to share any final thoughts or if you have any plugs for anything that you would like to bring attention to. Um, we can start with Andrea. Yeah, I, guess, I think there was a, a question in the a chat about um, engaging uh, specific community members. Um, and, I, and I think about, I, I guess, I think that was something along those lines, but I, I guess kind of related a lot to that question, being a settler in, in Ohlone, un, unceded Ohlone land here in, in Berkeley and being new to this area. Um, and, you know, one thing that I, I, I mean, it's not really a solution, but it's more like, I don't know, hopefully this relates to, to people whenever they're other natives, when they're on, they're settling on other lands is just knowing like the, you know, the history of like my communities, even within Puebloan like tribal politics, I, I admittedly, I'm kind of scared to also engage. I get, I get nervous because I don't, you know, I, I am settler in this, in these lands. And so I, yeah, I guess that's just maybe like my, my nerdy kind of in, I don't know, uh, uh, shy self, but uh, yeah, I, I, I do, I do wish that I could, um, you know, engage a bit more um, directly um, and try to figure out how to do that. It's most, yeah, mostly a prompt, maybe not a good ender, but <laughs> an admittance. No worries. Thank you so much, Andrea. And I've had similar quarrels like that because like Navajos are very hegemonic against other, like Pueblos, like the Hopis, for instance. So I, I understand what you're saying. Um, Matthew, would you like to go next? Sure. So I'm, I'm thinking about this more in terms of like urban spaces, um, this idea of where do you get guidance from? And I think that can be really challenging because of the politics that typically exists within urban Indian centers. So I think 
the best answer, or at least the answer that's worked best for me is really just try and talk to everybody. Um, get a better understanding of where everything is sitting and then identify places that you can uh, contribute to the entire community as a whole and work in those spaces. Thank you. Rosie, would you like to I don't finish up? Um, I guess um, if I had anything great to say, not or not even not great to say, what I want to leave you all with is wherever you're at now is okay. You know, I think a lot of times we walk with a lot of guilt, like, I'm not indigenous enough. I'm so far away from my family. I'm not able to go to a ceremony and protocol. I don't even like know anybody in these spaces. Um, you are enough just as you are. Your community is waiting for you so that when you are ready, whenever that is, if it's next week, next month, or 10 years from now, um, to pick up that relationship, it will be there for you. So, I mean, that's me just speaking to the indigenous um, scientists out there because I remember when I was in grad school I had like extreme culture shock and felt really isolated when when Maggie was giving her talk yesterday I, I actually wrote to her and I was like thank you for saying all these things I felt exactly that way and and that's just what I want to leave with maybe it's a good you know Maggie opening that up and then we can close with wherever you're at is okay you are enough whatever you're doing is enough Awesome. Thank you so much to the panelists for sitting on this panel. And thank you to the organizers for making this happen. And thank you to all of you for, for listening. Yeah, thank you all for that amazing discussion. I mean, like, and, and I love this. It's EK bomb. I, I, I love this. Yeah, yeah. There's so many, so many, and so much wisdom. And, you know, I just like, uh, uh, there's so so many of these questions or things that I was that I've been pondering for a while. So I'm just really grateful for for all of the wisdom. And Lee Andrew, I'm really grateful for you hosting and holding space. I think you did an amazing job. Um, yeah, we're happy to have you here at UCSF and super fortunate too. You know, so um, and yeah, so we're gonna take a little bit of a break now. I think a 15 minute break before we come back for our last talk, which is Cliff Poudry, um, who will help close us out of. Um, everyone take when in, in 15 minutes. All right. All right, I suppose we can get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Cliff Poudry. Um, we've all heard so much about Cliff throughout the course of the symposium and, and the ways that he's influenced many of us and, um, and, and had a major influence. I, I think it's just truly incredible the um, work that Cliff has done over the over many, many years of um, advocating for and creating funding for diverse scientists in STEM, and particularly with diversity supplements. She helped pioneer at the NSF and then um, were inspirations for the NIH, which I think created, um, which I'm sure many of us have benefited from, um, as, as well as so many other programs. So um, yeah, and, and currently Cliff is a courtesy professor at University of Oregon, and I believe also a uh, emeritus professor at UC um, Santa Cruz. Uh, but I'll, I'll let Cliff tell us whatever he's going to tell us. I, I, I'm genuinely curious because his talk title is Three Secrets. So it's been a great mystery to me. Thank you, Willow. Um, I'm trying to uh, tell my computer to, to start. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hang on just a second. I have a I have a blank black screen, but uh, hopefully hopefully it's gonna gonna come up here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the, uh, the the opportunity to to be here and to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I, I must say that the the uh, the, the last uh, um, the last session is uh, uh, very very you know, very very thoughtful. It's going to be a be a tough act to uh, tough act to follow. Um, 
So let me uh, let me begin by saying Sagoli, and you know, and I'm coming to you from the uh, ancient lands of the Kalapuya in uh, in western Western Oregon. Um, as I said, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the the opportunity to uh, um, to to talk. It's quite a quite a challenge following uh, actually all of the presentations. It's been a a, a terrific uh, symposium, and just uh, um, you know a, a great uh, a great joy and um, and and in in many ways. Uh, uh, something that uh, I, I might have hoped would, would have happened a, a long time ago. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to tell you a, a few stories, um, and um, in some ways these will um, will uh, align with uh, some of the talks today, but but in some ways they won't. Um, and and one reason is because the uh, neither person. In this, in these pictures, uh, either the one on the left or the one on the right, um, had any thoughts of uh, of being a scientist uh, growing up, uh, or much less a professor or or administrator, um, or or even a uh, or even somebody that that accomplished uh, uh, other things. Um, and, and certainly, they uh, they didn't think about issues of uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, that much about my early life uh, on the res, except uh, to say that uh, I had uh, I had many experiences that other people just don't get to have. Uh, some might have called them uh, hardships. Um, um, some might call them life lessons. But, uh, but I certainly um, I certainly benefited from a uh, from a rich um, rich childhood. Um, <clears throat> but for one thing, I was raised by five different families. Uh, by the time that I was uh, I was five years old, uh, so so that that gives you you know um, a, a number of, of aunties and, and 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 grandmas to uh, to take care of you. So uh, uh, indeed, uh, I, I was very fortunate. So the only career ambition that I can recall um, from growing up was that uh, I, I wanted to be a, um, a high school football coach. Uh, this might have been something one of my uncles had mentioned to me or whatever, but uh, that that was that was an ambition, um, and uh, and I knew that you couldn't just be a coach that uh, that that didn't pay the bills, um, and and so being being a teacher, being a high school teacher, uh, while it wasn't a particular ambition, uh, was, was something that uh, that that I thought I would do, uh, and then in fact my I liked my high school. Um, chemistry teacher, um, and and he had indeed been a football coach uh, earlier in, in his career. Jumping just a little ahead in my junior year of college, um, something else I thought of doing, uh, I applied to be a technician in a nuclear fuel recycling plant. Um, I, I didn't I didn't realize that uh, uh, employers uh, look at your grades. Uh, my grades weren't uh, that great. Uh, barely barely above a C and so I didn't I didn't get the job um, you know on the one hand disappointments are disappointments but yeah you know, can you imagine what my life would have been um, had uh, had had I gotten a job um, some uh, a theme that I'm going to present is that uh, is that one thing leads to another and, and sometimes we don't know uh, where it's going to lead or what's going to happen along the way um, I got hurt uh, in football practice uh, the start of my senior year. Okay, bad luck, right? Uh, but that led to a very fortuitous um, experience, a, a great class that uh, that I would never have, uh, have taken otherwise. Um, while I was in the hospital, uh, I missed the uh, class registration. And in the old days, that was an in-person, long line, uh, kind of uh, all, all day uh, affair. So by the time that uh, I got out of the hospital and, and went to register for classes, um, all, all of the classes that I was interested in were, were, were gone. Um, and one that was left was uh, compar comparative plant anatomy. Uh, that would not have been my first choice. Um, in fact, um, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do with a, a comparative plant uh, anatomy. Um, but uh, as... Uh, <laughs> As luck would have it, um, the, uh, the the professor 
of the class um, pictured here was, uh, was, was Joe Heinle. And uh, when he came in the, the, the first day, uh, he came down the, the, the aisle in the, in the auditorium and he saw the crutches and, and, uh, and cast. And he asked what happened. I told him that uh, I'd gotten hurt uh, uh, playing football. Uh, but since he didn't believe the biology major would actually be a football player, uh, he asked his buddy, uh, the coach, and the coach was, uh, was in fact, uh, Buddy Ryan. And he confirmed that it, indeed I, I was on, on the team. <clears throat> so that, that set in motion <laughs> uh, a, a kind of a life-changing event for me. You, you see, um, now you know, he knew my name, uh, he knew the coach, um, I, I couldn't skip class. Um, I, I couldn't sleep in class. Um, uh, consequently, uh, you know, I, I paid attention and, and I learned things that, uh, that I probably otherwise wouldn't. Learn. I learned about the vessels of, uh, of vascular plants, their walls, and I got to, to learn uh, exotic terms such as the meristem, the attenta, and the, the no initial. Uh, these are about uh, areas that uh, um, um, are, are part of their, their uh, uh, development. Um, and um, I got an A in the class. Um, so, you know, who knew? Uh, actually paying attention, listening, and whatever, uh, taking interest uh, uh, made a difference. I, I got an A in the class. Um, and um, Dr. Hyman had a, another uh, advanced uh, um, plant class the, the next semester. And since, since I liked I liked him. Um, I, I took uh, that that second class, um, and in that class, I actually learned a practical skill. Uh, you see, uh, the lab part of the class uh, included a special project in which we would make uh, histological sections, including some serial sections uh, of plant material. Well, most of the people in the class um, did uh, onion root tips. They're very easy, they're small, you slice right through them. Um, it, it, it works very well. I actually uh, did that, but then decided not to do that for my, uh, for my project. Uh, what I did was to take cereal sections through a small carrot. Uh, and I also did sections through, uh, through a banana. Um, when I turned my specimens in, um, you wait a few days to after he, he grades and looks at them. Um, he, uh, he, when I went to meet him in his office, uh, he was very complimentary, he said, uh, great sections. But he also asked if he could keep my slides. He said, no, no one's ever done these slides. And he said, I, I actually don't have slides of a banana uh, in, in, my, in my collection. Uh, and he complimented me on my independent thinking. Um, and that uh, that recognition, well, or, or that, that compliment at least, uh, really uh, gave me a boost. It it, it did uh, it did wonders for me. Um, continuing on my quest, though, to become a uh, football coach and a uh, uh, a science teacher, I decided to do a master's, and and I by good fortune, uh, chose to do a master's in science and biology rather than a master's in, in education. Uh, th this was a tough go at the time um, because of my poor grades. Uh, you know, I was lucky to get in and I did not have any financial aid. So in the summers to be able to make enough that uh, I wouldn't have to um, work too much in the winter, um, I worked uh, um, at nights in the steel mill and in days uh, painting houses. So I was putting in uh, 60 to 70 hour weeks. Um, fortunately, it was just a few months of, of the summer, but uh, that was uh, that was what I had to do because I hadn't been such a such a good undergraduate student. Um, in my master's thesis, I was able to take advantage of that skill that uh, that I'd learned, that histological sectioning, and in fact, my um, my project involved uh, studying the um, effects of uh, hormones. On, uh, on changes in the skin of, uh, uh, of salamanders. Um, when I went on to a PhD, my uh, advisor, uh, knowing that I had uh, done histology, uh, said, well, you know, why don't, why don't you learn electron microscopy? We have, have need for, for that, and that would be uh, an extension of, uh, of your skills in histology. So you see, uh, one, one thing leads to another. Um, you know, it started out with a, with a knee injury, 
um, and then uh, meeting a, a, a professor because um, I took a class that I didn't want to take in, in comparative plant anatomy. But uh, this professor, um, um, in fact, was a, was a boost to, uh, to, to, to my ego um, and learned and I and taught a, uh, a technique that not only would I use in that undergraduate class, but I used uh, um, as a master's student and then was a lead in to uh, work that I did as a, as a graduate student. Uh, incidentally, my first publication uh, as a PhD student uh, was on electron microscopy and it, uh, it became a citation classic. So you see one, one thing uh, leads to another. Um, I didn't meet another native scientist um, until I was uh, actually applying for jobs. Uh, so there, there were no natives in science uh, at the University of Buffalo when, when I was there, either the graduate program or even the undergraduate program. Um, and I had, I had never met another native science. Uh, th this person, Frank Telemontes, uh, was a colleague at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And he had been a grad student at Berkeley. And while at Berkeley, uh, he had met uh, Frank Dukapu. And so he asked me um, you know, whether I knew Frank and, and, and I did not, uh, but, uh, but he introduced me to, um, to, to Frank um, and the two of them um, actually introduced me to, uh, to, to Satnus and to Asus. And um, uh, Frank and I really hit it off well. Uh, as, uh, as Matt uh, mentioned earlier, um, at the time, Frank and I, as far as we knew, were the only two um, native uh, geneticists. Um, I, I worked on fruit flies, actually fruit fly development. Uh, I used genetics uh, uh, to study fruit fly development. So in fact, I'm uh, sort of an honorary geneticist uh, uh, more, than, uh, more than an actual geneticist. But, uh, but Frank was a, a geneticist. And um, in addition to, to being, as far as we knew, the only two um, um, native geneticists, as we were about only one of our two of five uh, native scientists uh, in the in the country at, at the time. There, there may have been a, a couple of more, but uh, but but we didn't we didn't know who, who they were. Um, um, Frank and I, uh, um, as I say, became good friends. Um, we we sort of had a a similar sense of, of humor um, and. Um, when we would, when we would, uh, at various meetings, uh, uh, get together, one of the things that we often talked about were our, our uh, some of our outside interests, our hobbies. Uh, Frank was a magician, and he used magic um, in uh, um, to, as as a tool to engage students, particularly high school students that uh, that he would be uh, talking to. It was mentioned earlier that he developed a, a native uh, honorary honor, honor society. For, for, for students. And when he would do these kinds of things in his classes or these other special things, uh, he, would, uh, he would employ um, genetics as a, as a way of keeping students' attention. Um, at the time, I was beginning to learn wood turning and uh, um, I, would, uh, I would go take uh, uh, various work workshops to, to learn and he was taking various workshops to learn his magic. And <laughs> we would compare, compare notes. Um, and often these, uh, these courses, these mini courses, um, a weekend course would cost a thousand bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd have to pay for our, our getting there, tuition for the, the class and, uh, and, and the like. Um, but, uh, you know, since, since we paid, we were paying for those courses, um, we, we would commiserate and say how, you know, we really would do our best to squeeze everything out of them. You know, we'd be there first thing in the morning, be there to the end of the day. Uh, and, and of course, we would, uh, we would have just um, been very upset if the person that decided to uh, you know, leave a couple of hours earlier or, or take, take the app, give us the, the afternoon off. Um, but that actually had us uh, thinking about uh, situations that we were finding in various student programs that, uh, that we were running. Uh, we, we both noticed um, somewhat to our dismay that, uh, that, that sometimes students would uh, be asking to, to leave early um, or uh, especially if it was uh, coming up on um, you know, Friday afternoon, uh, whether, they could, uh, whether they could take the, uh, the, the, time, the, the time off. 
Um, and, and in fact, some, some would tell us that uh, had they not been paid to attend uh, you know, one of our, our, our workshops, one of the uh, programs that we had, uh, that they, they wouldn't have, uh, have participated. Frank and I worried about that a lot. Uh, we knew that uh, you know, the students had difficulties and certainly uh, covering their expenses was, uh, was very important. But, but we did wonder uh, whether, whether it was us, whether, whether we needed to uh, design and build uh, better, uh, better workshops. Um, but we, we often talked about uh, how important the notion of self-investment was. Um, and we understood that we all have dreams, we have aspirations, but uh, if, if you don't have the, um, the gumption to carry it out, if you don't have the self-investment to actually do it, uh, these are, are all, all uh, simply a dream. Um, so one thing leads to another. Uh, Frank Talamantes introduced me to Frank Dukapu. Uh, the two of them uh, introduced me to uh, both, uh, both SACNAS and, and ACES, uh, which they were involved in the very first conversations. Uh, I was involved uh, a, a year or two later, so I'm, I'm not a founder of, uh, of either organization, just, a, just one of the, the old guys that was there early on. Um, at uh, ACES, uh, I met uh, uh, Don Ashapanek. Um, uh, a Delaware uh, Chetcoke Indian uh, who was on the faculty at, uh, at Haskell. And, uh, and, and Don told me about this uh, program um, that uh, was taking place uh, up in Northern Michigan um, uh, called Headlands Indians into Health Careers. Uh, it, was, uh, it was run out of the University of Oklahoma um, and they took about 24 uh, native students um, each summer for a, a summer long um, um, more than a, more than a course, it was uh, it was like a, a summer long uh, pre college uh, kind of uh, uh, professional development, and um, he also introduced me to Professor uh, uh, Joe Ferretti. Um, Joe was the uh, chair of uh, microbiology and immunology at the University of Oklahoma, and and he was the uh, he was the director of the Headlands. Uh, Headlands program, um, and I'll, I'll come back to a, a little bit more about uh, Joe later on, but uh, the point that I want to, to make is, again, one thing leads to another. Um, uh, knowing Frank Talamantes uh, uh, led me to Frank Dukupu, which led me to um, uh, Sacknes Asis, and Donna Schopenek, and, and that led me to uh, an activity that I would otherwise really never have participated in, uh, number one, I wouldn't have known about it. And, and even if I had known about it, I, I might not have uh, um, you know, thought to, um, that I might, uh, might be part of it, except that this personal connection, um, having met Don and having introduced me to Joe, um, I, I was actually uh, invited to be uh, on the faculty and then later on the advisory board to, to the program. So um, you know, many things, one thing leads to another. I, I'd be remiss um, if I didn't also say that while, um, while serving on the board of directors of ACES, uh, I met the person who would become my wife, Nancy Wallace, uh, uh, Comanche. Uh, so again, uh, one, one thing leads to another. Um, while, a, uh, while an assistant professor um, and, uh, and with all the duties of, uh, of an assistant professor, um, I was uh, I was asked or offered the opportunity to serve on the uh, University of Cancer uh, University of California Cancer Research Coordinating Committee re Review Committee. Um, why me? Um, actually, just uh, a matter of good luck or bad luck. Uh, each campus of the um, nine campus UC system is allowed to have one representative um, on the on the review committee. And the person that had been serving uh, on the Santa Cruz campus uh, was rotating off, and uh, and he he selected me, um, suggested me. So uh, so I was uh, uh, a reviewer then uh, for a, a three year term uh, on this uh, cancer research uh, coordinating committee. The work was really a challenge. It was it was a lot of work. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, work in cancer biology, you know, me being a fruit fly geneticist, um, was, 
of course, beyond my uh, original experience, but, uh, but much of the work uh, dealt with uh, biochemistry or developmental biology, cell biology, things that uh, at least I had a, a limited background and, and could, could do my homework. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of work, took a lot of time, um, um, but it, was, it turned out to be a great experience. And one of the things that actually um, made it uh, even greater was the, uh, the chairman of the committee, Professor Harry Rubin um, from, from Berkeley, um, was, was just a scholar. Uh, when, when he did his reviews, um, he, he didn't read his reviews um, to, to the panel. Um, he had them down on the table and, and he, would, he would look at us. He'd look at us, uh, uh, look around the table and um, he would explain um, almost like, like, a, like a teacher, um, you know, what, uh, what was important uh, about this uh, application or, or not, um, you know, what was its strengths and what were its limitations? Um, how did the uh, previous um, work that the uh, proposer um, had done, how did that fit in? How was this a, uh, you know, a logical, uh, logical step? Um, it, it, was, it, it was amazing um, you know, how much I learned um, just from hearing him do these reviews of other people's work. Um, he, he, set, he set the standard. Uh, so um, one of the things that I tried to do, uh, probably not uh, nearly as well as, uh, as I should have or, or would have liked to, as I, I tried to emulate. So I saw in, in Professor Rubin uh, the kind of scholar that I wanted to be, at least, at least when it came to reviewing other people's science, reviewing other people's grants. I, I didn't know what he was like as a person or as a teacher or whatever, but with regard to this aspect, I, I saw someone that, uh, um, that, that, that I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be able to, to, to do as, um, as well. A consequence of being on that committee was that uh, I was actually asked to serve on others committee, other committees. Uh, as I say, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, someone on the CRCC committee, uh, and, and I don't know who, uh, had, uh, had suggested my name um, to, uh, to the folks at, at NSF um, who were looking for reviewers on the Developmental Biology Committee. And so I served on the uh, uh, NSF committee. I actually served on, on other committees. And, and again, this was um, due to people who um, I'd gotten to know uh, along the way, uh, putting, putting my name in. Um, Mary Clutter, uh, who was at the NSF, um, and had uh, uh, overseen the, uh, the, the, the panels uh, uh, early on, uh, was, uh, was a division director and was looking to uh, hire uh, a new NSF program director. So having seen me for several years going three times a year at, at NSF, um, she, uh, she asked, she invited me to be the uh, program director. In fact, uh, she took me out to lunch. She was, uh, she was very persuasive. She, she said, I've got five reasons why I want you to be the, the program director. Um, and uh, um, even though that wasn't uh, something that was ever in my, uh, in my vision, in my, in my sights, um, I, I was convinced that it would be good for me and that I could, uh, I, I could do some service. Um, so I accepted being the uh, uh, program director um, for a uh, a two-year uh, rotation stint there. Um, and you do a rotation, you spend a couple of years uh, there uh, at NSF, and then you go back to your, uh, your, your home campus. When I got back to Santa Cruz uh, after a, a year or so, um, the, the dean asked me to be uh, the chair of the department, biology department, um, and I, I, I declined. I, I couldn't imagine a job I just couldn't imagine it. You know, I, I didn't like uh, uh, any bickering. I didn't like the idea of, uh, of you know, having to um, satisfy some of my colleagues and not others of my colleagues. I, I didn't want to uh, have anything to do with disputes or, or arguments like that. I just, I just couldn't imagine it. Um, the, the dean was, uh, um, was persistent um, and um, he, he gave me uh, 
a couple of reasons why um, why it would be important to serve. Um, he, he didn't say it would be good for me. <laughs> um, he, he said that, that this was something that uh, um, he hoped that I would do that uh, um, that that I could you know maybe make a make a contribution. Um, so I accepted, and much to my surprise, it turned out to be jobs ever. Um, as a department chair, uh, I knew the research of all of faculty. Uh, in fact, I knew the research of, uh, of the, the graduate students. Uh, I was still teaching. And so um, uh, the graduate class that I taught, um, it, was, it was very comfortable because um, I, you know, I, knew, uh, I, I knew the, the students and, and I was able to, uh, uh, to help them. Um, but another important thing was that uh, it wasn't just a job uh, about me. The um, uh, department chair has, uh, has a staff and has uh, you know, other people helping. And, and I learned how important, how important that is in terms of uh, getting things done is that, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just you, the, the, the chair or whatever, whatever job you have, but, uh, but in fact, it's, it's, it's the people around you. It's the, uh, the, the people that uh, are doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the legwork uh, to, to make things happen. Um, while, uh, while I was a, a chair, um, the department was um, um, invited to submit uh, a grant for a, an undergraduate support uh, a kind of program from HHMI. And so uh, along with, uh, with a couple of other colleagues, um, I, I wrote, a, wrote a grant and, uh, um, and, and indeed uh, uh, we got an award from, uh, from HHMI. Um, uh, coincidentally, um, one of the uh, one of the professors, one of the uh, chair of the of a department here at the, um, uh, at UCSF, Jeremy Ryder, Professor Jeremy Ryder, was an undergraduate in that uh, in that summer program. Again, no good deed goes unpunished. The, the folks at HHMI, um, you know, knew I was a, a grantee and uh, knew something about these kinds of programs, so they asked me to be a, a reviewer. Um, actually, quite a number of times I was asked to be, uh, be a reviewer and um, also ended up uh, reviewing for other organizations, including, including Danforth. Um, the, uh, the dean um, uh, had stepped down and, uh, and I was asked uh, to step in as, uh, as an acting dean. Um, that, uh, oops, going too fast. Um, that uh, activity was again not something that uh, that I would have chosen, but uh, again it turned out to be wonderful. And part of what made it wonderful was uh, uh, was the staff that that I had. Uh, we worked well together. Uh, they they actually supported me in, in some ways. I, I was I was a puppet dean uh, because the staff did uh, all this work in preparing and getting things uh, ready for me to, um, to to go in the meetings uh, and a. Uh, a very fortunate, uh, if tragic, but a very fortunate event happened. Just one month into being the dean, the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake happened. Um, you know, not not a good thing to, to happen on your watch, right? However, um, in terms of my uh, my learning, my my on the job training, uh, my training in in, in crisis management. Um, you know, being being thrust into that, being the uh, the acting dean um, at right after um, a major earthquake, uh, the epicenter was only nine miles from the from the campus. Uh, uh, this turned out to be another one of those things that uh, uh, sometimes really bad luck, you know, provides other kinds of uh, of benefits um, if, if if you take them. Um, after serving there, um, taking a couple of years off, uh, I was asked uh, to be the Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Affairs, not a job I would have um, uh, ever uh, sought out. Um, that position oversees uh, financial aid, um, admissions, uh, the EOP program, um, the Student Learning Center. Uh, again, things that I didn't necessarily feel uh, particularly um, uh, trained for, um, but I, I guess they, they felt that uh, uh, I'd shown the ability to make uh, good, fair decisions, and that that was an important uh, important part of the uh, uh, for the job. Um, 
as a consequence, perhaps, of uh, serving in those administrative positions on campus, I was invited to apply um, for um, a position at the NIH, a, a division director uh, for the Minority Opportunities and Research Division, later became the uh, Training Workforce uh, Development uh, uh, Division. Um, and um, I was asked to apply, uh, once again, this was not something that, uh, that I could imagine doing. Um, I liked being at Santa Cruz. I liked having my lab. Um, things were, were wonderful there. Um, but um, but I, I'd been invited to apply by, uh, by a good colleague, and so, so I did. Um, I got an interview, and that, that worried me. Um, I, I didn't want them to think, well, you know, just kidding and, and say, no, you know, <laughs> I didn't put in an application for real. Um, so, um, so I went through with the, uh, the, the interview process and I decided uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them uh, such, such a bold um, a plan for actually changing some things um, that they, they won't want to do that. And so I, I thought, I actually studied uh, what the issues were and, uh, and came up with a, with a bold plan. Um, I, I wish I could say that, uh, that this was because I was really out to solve all the problems, but I think I was uh, more interested in the plan being bold uh, than I was in, in all of the problems. But uh, uh, I had a good interview. Um, and uh, toward the end of the interview, I said, well, you know, if, if chosen, this is, this is what I would want to do. And, and so I laid out that plan and I was sure that they were going to say, well, you know, thank you very much. That's, that's not what we do in the government. Um, but the person that was uh, um, the, uh, the director of the Institute said, well, that's exactly what, what I would want to do. He says, uh, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you, you thought of it. Says, I, I would like to see that done with, with one caveat. He said, uh, it'll have to be by evolution, not revolution. That is, he, he liked what I was hoping to accomplish. Um, he was a little, little afraid about some of the methods that, uh, that I was thinking about. Um, but uh, um, we, had a, we had a wonderful, wonderful evening. And um, after much deliberation, and in fact, uh, uh, my, my wife sort of casting the, uh, the, the deciding, deciding vote, uh, decided to leave Santa Cruz and, uh, and, and go spend uh, a few years um, in, at, at the NIH. What, uh, what started out to be a five-year um, um, deal uh, ended up uh, spending uh, 20 years uh, in, in the division. So again, one thing leads to another. Uh, I didn't know that service on the uh, um, Cancer Review Committee would lead to uh, being asked to be on other committees or that that exposure would lead to being uh, asked to be a program director or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One thing leads to another. And we often don't know uh, what, what those things are, are, are going to be. Um, because I had uh, been an HHMI grantee and they knew me well um, uh, from serving on review committees for, uh, for about 15 years, uh, when it came time to retire, um, I, I was asked to, if I would be interested in being a senior fellow at HHMI. I, I couldn't think in that case of, of, of a better place, better job. Uh, doing the kinds of things, working with uh, the Gilliam uh, Fellow Program and other programs that, that turned out to be just a, just a delight for the, um, for, for the end of my stay in Washington. Um, I'm going to change, change direction a little here um, and uh, talk to you about a, a truth, a truth that could affect uh, your, your professional year. Um, with apologies to a couple of Matthews in, in the audience, um, I'm going to talk just a, a few minutes about the about the Matthew effect, um, which is uh, which is that um, people that uh, that have more uh, seem to get more. That is, there's a a notion of uh, of accumulated advantage. The, the the rich get richer. So how does that uh, affect uh, us in in the sciences and uh, uh, and, and how does it affect uh, our professional lives, uh, especially things like research funding? So here's, a, uh, here, here's some data um, from um, the European 
uh, research uh, organization. And this com compares the trajectory of research funding uh, in, in two groups. The, uh, the group in line with the green um, had just barely, just, just barely um, um, gotten a, a score, just, just enough to get funded. The one in the red had just barely missed out. So, so in terms of, uh, of score numbers, they're just about identical. But in the one case, they got the funding. In the other case, they didn't get the funding. So what happened in the, in the years uh, since then? Uh, so what you can see is that uh, there, is, uh, there develops a, a considerable difference over time. Those that just narrowly secured the grant um, uh, end up uh, doing quite a bit better than those who just narrowly um, um, missed getting, uh, getting the grant. Um, now, this, this is important for us uh, in case uh, I, I don't come back to it, that um, um, for, for those of us that are applying for, for funding, um, you know, we, we, don't always get, uh, we don't always get what we want. And, uh, and sometimes uh, you know, it, it hits hard because we, we write those applications, uh, whether it's for fellowships or scholarships, or whether it's for research grants or, or other support. Um, and, um, and sometimes we get them, but um, actually more often uh, we don't. And, um, and how that affects us is, uh, is quite important. Um, just uh, another way of looking at this kind of information. Uh, this, this graph doesn't show actual data, but it's, uh, um, so it's, it's a little bit of a made up uh, data, uh, but using information on future productivity of, uh, of grantees um, or applicants by their peer review score. And so what you can see is that the, uh, those in the lower left that got the uh, poor, uh, poor scores uh, also over time uh, generally have uh, less, uh, less productivity, where those on the far right, those that get the terrific scores, um, generally they have uh, higher productivity. And the important thing to notice is that the line in the middle, this is called a um, regression discontinuity kind of a graph. So just to the left of the line are people um, who are just about as good as those just to the right of the line, but if the ones to the right of the line got funded and the ones to the left didn't, their productivity uh, over time is, uh, is, is significantly, um, significantly different uh, just from being uh, that close to the line. Um, it goes a little bit farther than that though, which is very interesting, is that um, uh, if we look at the three green lines to the top, the solid one is those that are just right above the line. Uh, but the other two, are those that um, actually scored much better, who, who um, would have otherwise you know, really been uh, approved. So um, what I see here is that over time, the person that just made it over the line actually ends up doing as well as those that scored much, much better um, um, at, at the time of the review. Uh, similarly, uh, the ones in red, uh, the, the ones that are, are just just missed out the, the solid line there. They end up doing just as poorly as those that were several ranks below, uh, below the cutoff. What's important to think about is does this have to be destiny? Uh, that is, if you, if you miss out on funding, if you miss out on that fellowship, if you uh, miss out, uh, does this mean that uh, um, that, that, that's your trajectory. Well, this, this is, uh, you know, the, the summary of, uh, of uh, a lot of, a lot of people's responses, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be our response, response. It doesn't have to be your response. Um, the, uh, the, the notion is that, uh, there really shouldn't be any difference between the solid green line and the solid red line. What, what, undoubtedly makes up that difference is how we react, how we react to either the success or the challenge. And, um, and if we, if we uh, keep an open mindset, if we, uh, if we think of ways to improve, 
if we see ourselves as, as someone that can improve, as opposed to this being a final judgment, well, if, you know, they didn't pick me, I obviously wasn't any, any good. If we can keep a positive um, uh, outlook and go back and perhaps redo, there isn't any reason why we have to get stuck down on the red side of the graph, um, um, but uh, we can join the, the folks on the, uh, on the right side of the graph. Um, I'm gonna give another change of direction. Uh, in, in part uh, uh, related to the last in that. Uh, so, so how do we uh, how do we improve? How do we get better? Um, how do we um, how do we learn? And feedback, feedback that we get um, is uh, is very important. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a little little bit more of a uh, of a of a metaphor. I tell you a, a story of the feedback where I sort of got an aha moment uh, about. Uh, about what feedback uh, is. Um, when I was a teenager, um, we, um, we around the property, my, my, my mom would find, um, would find arrowheads uh, that were uh, made from you know, the, the, the local flint. Um, our, our, our ancestors uh, living on those, those lands uh, where our reservation was for thousands of years um, had left, left a lot of uh, arrowheads around and so uh, we, would find them in the garden uh, from time to time. And, and she told me that uh, these were made from, uh, from flint and in fact had pointed out uh, uh, a rock formation, um, some cliffs where, where there were uh, uh, mines that uh, the, the, the people at the time would go and, and, uh, and, and get flint for, for making spearheads and, and arrowheads. Well, uh, you know, being native, I, I figured it must be in my blood. Uh, making arrowheads is just something I, I, should, I should know how to do, right? Um, my mom told me, well, you know, they, they actually flaked and chipped the, the arrowhead with, uh, with, with deer antlers. And uh, uh, I had some uh, deer antlers, so uh, I went and I, I got some of that, uh, that flint and uh, uh, got my, my deer antlers. And, um, and I tried and tried and tried to you know, make, uh, make an arrowhead um, out, of the, out of the flint. All I got was funny looking little broken pieces of rock. And, uh, and, and, and sore hands um, and, uh, uh, and a lot of frustration. Uh, so, so, so much for being a, uh, an, inborn, um, an inborn skill. Um, uh, this was clearly something that, that I was gonna have to uh, learn. In fact, I, I put it aside for, for some time. I, I thought, you know, this is just crazy. I don't, know how, I don't know how those old ancestors did it because everything that I did just, just turned, turned to, to crumble. So some years later, some years later, I read a book about uh, Ishi, the last of the uh, uh, last of the Yahi tribe, and in that book, uh, it described how he made uh, uh, arrowheads, um, and it, it actually described how he um, how how he held um, the, the the rock and and how he held the uh, um, the, the antler, but uh, but actually more importantly, um, it it told me that he did. Um, demonstrations for uh, for the museum, um, and that, uh, that that sometimes instead of uh, going out and, and using uh, natural rock uh, from California, uh, that he would use uh, broken wine bottles. Imagine that, I an arrow hits from broken wine bottles. Um, well, that actually um, was a, a little bit of a little bit of a breakthrough. Um, I, some, some years, uh, uh, or sometimes after that, um, I thought, well, you know, why don't I give it a try? Uh, why don't I see? Um, and, and so indeed, um, here are the uh, uh, two, two green ones are examples from, uh, from wine bottles. Um, uh, it turned out that uh, uh, when I tried to do it, um, I actually was able to teach myself Again, knowing how he held it, seeing, seeing that picture, seeing how he held the deer antler, um, I was able to teach myself uh, how to make, uh, make arrowheads. Um, now, the, the message is that not is not that you should go out and drink wine uh, to get wine bottles before making arrowheads. The, the message is that um, there was a difference here. And the difference was that the, the glass fractured in, in quite predictable ways. Uh, unlike the flint or the, or, or the other materials that I was using that sometimes when I, I would uh, push, it would shatter. Sometimes it would uh, 
flake in the way that I thought it should, but um, but more often than not, it, it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. But the glass, it turned out, um, you know, I just was able to do it as as I thought it, it should be done, and I could chip, 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 and first thing you know, um, I had myself uh, an ugly arrowhead. Um, now maybe a little bit uh, better arrowhead. And I was able to go from uh, wine bottle glass to volcanic glass, obsidian. And so I was able to make um, different arrowheads out of, uh, out of uh, obsidian. So, so what was the difference? What was the difference? Um, because the feedback that I was getting from the glass um, was, um, was reliable. Um, it told me when I was doing something right, and it also told me when I was doing something wrong. Um, this, was, this was different from uh, when I was working on the flint because sometimes I would do it and, and it, would just, it would just crumble. And I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing right or wrong. But in, in this case, the, the glass um, um, offered me a, um, um, a, a good way to, to, to see whether I was doing it right or wrong and was able to, to, to learn um, and, and, and progress. So the, the glass gave me very usable feedback. Um, I was able to go from, as I said, the uh, uh, glass bottles to volcanic glass. And by the time I got back to doing agate and flint um, with their cracks and other flaws, um, I, I, I more or less knew what to expect. And I could tell when it broke because of the rock being soft or fractured versus when it broke because uh, because I had done something wrong. So what's what was my message in that uh, in that long story there is that uh, good feedback, good feedback that can both tell you uh, what's right, but also can help you to see what's wrong uh, can make uh, make all the difference in the world. So where do you get where do you get advice? Where do you get good good feedback? Um, in your professional career, certainly, uh, you want to seek out and, uh, and listen, to, uh, listen to good advice. Um, good advice may sometimes come from places that you don't necessarily expect, um, th though it may. Um, I had, uh, on my very first uh, grant application uh, that I was uh, submitting to NIH, um, after several drafts, uh, I put it together and there was a very esteemed uh, geneticist colleague on campus. And I asked if he would, uh, he would, if he would review my proposal. I had been, it had been suggested to other people to you know, have somebody else uh, review your proposal before you send it in. So I, I gave it to him and a couple of days later, um, I saw him and he, he, he just, he was all praised. He said that the application was very promising and, and he, didn't, he didn't have any concerns. Wow, slam dunk. Mail it in. It turned out I had uh, also um, um, given my uh, application to uh, another faculty member, um, one not nearly as as esteemed, but a uh, but a very thoughtful um, uh, geneticist and a, a person that that I like. And um, since I'd already given it to him, I didn't go ahead and mail my application in. I, I, I waited and had a chat with him. Um, and, and he was he was very nice. Um, he said that uh, he thought that the uh, uh, the ideas were exciting and the uh, and the approach was uh, uh, was was promising. He said, but the writing will likely be its downfall. Wow, you know, this one fantastic guy told me it was wonderful, and this other guy is telling me that the the writing is. Uh, you know, it would likely be my downfall. He he didn't think that uh, um, that that I would I would get a grant. Um, I listened, <laughs> had to keep a stiff upper lip. That was that was a bit of a shock. Um, and um, in the conversation, he, he told me that the uh, the reason was that uh, um, my my writing uh, had a number of ex uh, place number of examples where I'd used uh, genetic terms uh, kind of loosely or ambiguously, and that, uh, that these would be seen as uh, serious flaws. And, and one term uh, that I, I remember was the term selection. I, I'd use the selection like, you know, I, I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna select that. Uh, well, selection has a very different meaning for, for geneticists. And the, the fact that uh, I had used it um, uh, poorly um, would uh, it might suggest to them 
that, you know, maybe I really didn't know um, uh, as much as, uh, as I thought. Um, as, as we went on and, and he, he read my paper and he complimented the uh, positives and pointed out a number of things. One of the things by the end of the conversation, it was clear to me, he knew my research better than I did. Um, he had uh, he looked up some of the references that, that he didn't uh, that he hadn't known before. Uh, but uh, so, so this is just a, a friend in the department. Uh, he gave me a thorough review. And like I said, he knew my work better than I did. And I had to suck it up. I, I took his, his advice and I revised my my application. Actually, I revised it twice before sending it in. Uh, but uh, in fact, I, I ended up uh, getting funded on the first submission. Uh, that would have put me in the green uh, um, side of those uh, those Matthew uh, graphs. I, I mentioned uh, Joe Ferretti earlier. Um, and I mentioned that he was the chair of microbiology at the University of, uh, of Oklahoma. Um, about the time that uh, I was coming up for tenure at uh, UC Santa Cruz, um, um, I received a job offer from another institution that would have uh, would given me uh, much better opportunity to work with native communities. And, and that was something that while, I, while it wasn't a, a deal breaker for me, um, I, I was very interested in. So um, I, I was interested in being a place where I could do uh, more kind of work in native communities. And I certainly uh, had benefited from, enjoyed the experience that I had working with the Indian, Headlands Indian Health Careers Program. Uh, in addition, to the, uh, the job offer from this new place would have a lighter teaching load. Oh, that would be good. I'd get more work done. Uh, and it had a 25% increase in salary. Well, wow. Um, I, I, I had I already kind of made up my mind, but I called uh, Joe anyhow. Um, I, I was interested in taking the job and I was kind of sharing the good news. But, uh, but there was something else on my mind. You see, I was, uh, I was concerned at the time. I, I was not very happy with the uh, research space that I'd been given at, at Santa Cruz. And I, I wasn't, so I, I was a little bit uh, um, um, uh, irritating uh, by the way that at least I felt that I'd been uh, treated. Um, so Joe listened and we, we talked and, and, and laughed. And uh, near the end of the conversation, he said that it was his opinion that uh, I would have more opportunities to serve, whether it's serve native communities or serve uh, others if I stayed at the University of California. He said that um, I, would, uh, I would have more opportunities to have a, a bigger impact, um, that uh, he, he thought that credibility was important. And he also talked about bias in academia and said that um, if I stayed at the uh, um, at California, at the University of California, that bias would uh, actually uh, be in my favor. And uh, he, he just said, you know, kind of, kind of calmly, um, that uh, you know, if, if you want to make a, an impact uh, uh, over time, uh, he said, I, I would stay at the at Santa Cruz. Um, I, I didn't. That, that wasn't something I really wanted to hear. Um, in part because um, I, I think I had had my mind almost made up and. But I took what he said in, into, uh, into consideration. And uh, in spite of still being, you know, grinding my teeth about, uh, about lab space, uh, I decided to, uh, decided to stay at uh, UC Santa Cruz. But being at Santa Cruz, um, you know, I, I ran into some really terrific students. And, and just the joy of the, uh, the people that uh, I was able to, to work with, have in my lab, students in my courses, um, you know, that, that, made, uh, that made life uh, uh, just uh, a whole lot more worth it. Just the, the, the pleasure, the, the thrill of, of seeing, uh, seeing young people um, develop and do the things that, uh, that, that, that they want to do and, and become the, uh, the, the kind of people that uh, they want to do. Uh, this is Lupe Garcia on the left, uh, Scotty Henderson in the middle, and Johnny Orozco on the right. Uh, Johnny actually wasn't one of my lab students, but uh, uh, because he was good buddies, he, he, he said he was, he was an adopted uh, mentee of mine. Um, this is another picture of, uh, of Scotty and, um, uh, and Rudy Gamboa, 
uh, over on the left. Uh, this was at, a, at an ACES meeting. I, I enjoyed uh, uh, taking the, the students and sharing, um, uh, sharing them with, the, with, with other, other colleagues. So I, I wanna end um, with, uh, with a notion, you've heard it from Maggie, uh, that I think is really important for, uh, for your, my, our uh, professional development. Uh, on our reservation, as with uh, other tribes across the country, there are festivities through the year that, uh, that have uh, uh, games and dances and traditional, uh, uh, traditional um, uh, speeches. Um, the mid-year um, or New Year's uh, happens uh, you know, late in January. The maple syrup happens in March, the planting and strawberry festivals in the spring, the ripe corn in the uh, early summer, and I mean the, the green corn. And the ripe corn is a Thanksgiving festival that happens just about this time of year. These are all these are all festivals of uh, of Thanksgiving, and uh, in the Iroquois tradition, uh, there is, and there is no asking of the Creator, no prayers of, of asking. There are just prayers of uh, of thanks. Um, so I'd like to to end by saying that expressing gratitude is an act central to our uh, our culture. And in fact, it's a, it's a critical skill um, um, for your professional development. So I encourage you to give thanks to your families, give thanks to your colleagues, give thanks to your friends, um, give thanks to your, your, your teachers and, and your coworkers. Um, you'll, you'll find that it, uh, uh, that it, it lifts you up and, and, uh, and, and gives you more of an appreciation of your day, your life and your accomplishments. With that, I would like to thank Willow and the people that organized this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, gathering and, uh, and the people that uh, supported them from UCSF and also their, their, uh, their financial supporters. Uh, this has been uh, terrific for me uh, and I hope that uh, uh, it, it's been uh, as, as uh, rewarding for you. Again, now I am. Thank you so much for that, Cliff. That was really beautiful. And it was wonderful to see your story and, and, you know, reminders for us to let our path lead us to where it may and, 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 um, and also have gratitude and accept the world and its Matthew effect sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and all those are the reminder to receive feedback. Um, yeah, really, really grateful for your wisdom and, and sharing your story. Um, and with that, that closes out our last speaker. Um, and definitely ending on a high note there. And with, with someone that we are all, I think, many of us are indebted to for paving the path for us and providing funding opportunities. And even, even if Cliff, even if you didn't think you were gonna end up there, or if you didn't think that there's the job that you wanted, but um, you, you've had a massive impact on so many people. Um, yeah, I, we have now a closing ceremony recording. Um, that was by uh, the, the by um, Canyon as well to close us out. So. Mishmin Tuhis, Conrakot Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Ruth. I am so humbled and honored to share space with amazing minds and community. For those who are taking the time to honor truth and history and to navigate the legacy of indigenous pedagogies because when you think about honoring truth and history, and when we think about how we are in community, all of those layers are so very important. And within my community, we are of a matriarchal society and a matrilineal society. And so it's very important that we take the time to honor our women, to honor the earth, to honor all that has come before us to be humbled and accountable and reciprocal to the teachings and wisdoms 
that we have been influenced by. And as my mother and my grandmother have always taught me, honor the past to shape the future. In the Mutsun dialect, a prayer that my mother taught me, Pide Kanama Sika Batian Petel Kanoso Soto Kanoso. Translates to earth my body, water my blood, air my breath, and fire my spirit in the Mutsun Ohlone dialect. I say that because when we take a step away from Western settler colonialism, where we don't just see the earth as something to be commodified or a natural resource to extract from or something to capitalize off of, we take that time to humble ourselves with how it is we play a role in being in this space and time and how any action that we take can contribute to being good ancestors and training going forward in a good way about how our actions and our words can be accounted for and how we may be in community together and acknowledge all sacred living systems. And by acknowledging all sacred living systems, making decisions and recognizing the impact we have. And I say that because many of us have been brought up in an environment where we are engaging in primitive decision-making practices quick, knee-jerk, and reactionary. Many of us have been brought up in an environment where the education about indigenous peoples has been superficial, Native American hunter-gatherer, yet it dismisses indigenous peoples as the first doctors, as the first hydrologists, as the first scientists, as the first land managers, stewarding the land with fire and just being accountable to how humans will always have an impact on their environment, it's how we're brought up in society and how we're brought up within our communities of how we are accountable. So if I ask you to take anything from this, may we consider how we are being good ancestors in training. May we honor the past to shape the future and to honor and acknowledge pollinators and those tiny winged relatives who are part of my creation story, my ancestor's creation story in Ohlone territory, hummingbird and coyote and eagle were the first people. Animals and plants came before humanity. And so hummingbird helped bring life to the first people of the Bay Area. And so I wanna offer a little hummingbird song in a good way. So for those of us who are connectors, for those of you who are networkers, for those of you who acknowledge the pollinators, for those of you who are creators, that we just acknowledge humunya. Humunya in the Mutsun language is hummingbird. And I learned this song from my Rumsian relatives and their word for hummingbird is humaya. So being multilingual in our community, culture sharing and trading and just celebrating being alive in this time, the best day to be alive as an indigenous person since contact. So this is a little hummingbird song. <clears throat> Son, in breath, so it is in spirit. I thank you for your time, your energy, your effort, and just being in community, being a Ma Piritakawas, people of this land. And I encourage you to go forward to honor a Ma Piritakawas wherever you go, whenever you travel into a new space, and you honor truth and history and all layers. I happen to be a California Indigenous community member 
who likes to highlight pre-contact narratives. However, I've learned so much from so many allies, settlers, accomplices, advocates, co-conspirators. I've learned so much from these community members because they share with me perspective and ways of navigating the world that I'm unfamiliar with and ways of being together in community and also the layers of history that I'm less familiar with. So I find it so very important that we continue culture sharing, that we continue honoring truth and history and coming together because the future involves a multifaceted approach of solution building and collaborating. And the same way I think about that sentence, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nah, I really think it's hard to encourage an old dog to unlearn bad behavior. Everybody can learn something new. So thank you for sharing time and space with everyone. Thank you for acknowledging the people of this land. If we were in person, where are we? We are in Yalamu. The first language of this land, Ramatush. And I'm just a humble Mutsun Ohlone relative from Indian Canyon Nation, the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along Central Coastal California. Just one community member doing my due diligence in attempting to honor my ancestors to the best of my ability and to be a good ancestor in training. So if anything, I thank you. With that, I think um, close. I'm really grateful for all of the people who made um, who made this what it was. It was so wonderful to hear um, so wonderful to hear so many perspectives and 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 so many people's stories and their and what they're doing for the science and how they ended up in their science. I, I think today we had amazing speakers and and. Yesterday we had amazing speakers and, and both of our elders and the panelists. Um, it was very funny. I, I, I just have to share this because I found it so funny. My um, that I felt like the panel was electric today. There's so many ideas and my cats were like freaking out during it and they're like running around in circles. So they, they also felt it as well. But um, you know, I, I'm so grateful for um, uh, the lessons that, that that were discussed today and yesterday from, from Maggie, her the principles that she shared, which were to know your heart, look for the positivity or blessings even in challenging situations or especially in challenging situations, to embrace who we are and, and to show gratitude. And the Cliff's lessons, I think, which is allow our paths to unfold as they will and um, really to embrace and pursue feedback and also to show gratitude. Um, and in that, I'm just so grateful for all of you for making this space. I think this has been um, really, really wonderful. Um, and yeah, I, and, and I, just, I just really appreciate all of you and, and all of the people who aren't here currently. Um, with that, I also wanna say that land acknowledgement isn't necessarily enough always, and it's good for me to acknowledge that I am a settler on, um, on Ohlone land. And, and so I gave money today, I gave $100, my money to um, the Segorite Land Trust, which is trying to buy up land in the East Bay area to, to, to create a, a new space. And I think they're really, well. so I would encourage you um, to give to local native nonprofits in your area if you feel so inclined, because um, I think it's a good thing to do. Um, and because we have to not just acknowledge the land, but also find a way to give back. And, and remember, even if we are native in some places, we aren't native always where we are, and oftentimes we aren't, because um, the path leads us where we may be, and, and that might not be where your ancestors originated. Um, I also need to once again really acknowledge all of the people who helped me put this together and, and that, that we got to grow together and put this together. Um, and, and I really need to also do a big shout out to Dana, whose birthday it is today. Um, it's her ha happy birthday. Yay. Um, 
and she's on right now, which is, I'm, 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 she should be off having fun, but you know, I'm, I'm grateful for her to be here. So, um, and, and yeah, I'm just so grateful for everyone who, who helped make this what it was and all of the support staff that have been here, um, Alexa and Carolina and Gina, who have really been keeping everything on track and, and, um, and, and making sure that everything runs. Um, and uh, as, as well as the facilitators, um, or the people who moderated and, and the moderators of the discussion and really just everyone. We, we made this really wonderful. And, and of course, thank the funding. And, and one last thank you to everyone. So thanks for your time, those who joined us. And, um, and I, I hope you have a good rest of your day. <laughs>